colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. A very warm welcome to all of you to this virtual session, which again, like the one with the High Commissioner, is a first. An informal conversation on the, on, in the work of the Council on the so-called special procedures, that is the special rapporteurs and independent experts, etc., uh, in relation to the COVID crisis. I'm very grateful to all the members of the coordinating committee of these special procedures, and in particular to its chairperson, Mrs. Anita Ramasastri, as well as to the former chairman and ex officio member of the coordinating committee, Mr. Dianius Pires, for helping us make this session possible. As you know, the special procedures are often called the eyes and ears of the Human Rights Council, the fact finders who help the council keep track of what is going on all over the world in terms of human rights, including in areas which are very difficult to access. They spend all year on this very demanding work and very often do not get enough time or space to make their work known to a wider audience. At least for that matter, the current lockdown is a good opportunity. We have now all been through seven weeks of lockdown with the council stakeholders and its mechanisms, nevertheless, uh, using this for some very creative and persevering work. These, work. these weeks have shown us that the corona crisis affected essentially all kinds of human rights in one way or another. The right to life, the right to health, to adequate housing, clean water, sanitation, food, information, freedom of assembly, women's rights, children's rights, and of course, in particular, the rights of vulnerable groups. The coordinating committee not only helped us prepare this session with a lot of creativity and flexibility, but in addition, invested a lot of joint work um, in what is going to, think, uh, to be, I think, a precious souvenir of this meeting. And that is an overview which has been shared via the internet, the extranet, uh, to all of you, showing the tools and the means which the mandate holders have developed to assist states and other stakeholders in their response to the COVID crisis. And these tools include a general call by more than 60 mandate holders, uh, a wealth of up-to-date information which came in almost daily recommendations for national and international responses, guidelines, press releases, podcasts, video campaigns, you name it. And the special procedures have also said that the COVID-19 is a wake up call, and I quote, for the revitalization of human rights principles, which together with trust in scientific knowledge must prevail over the spread of fake news, prejudice, discrimination, inequalities, and violence. And they called for the principles of non-discrimination, participation, empowerment, and accountability to be applied to all health-related policies. So a very special bunch of virtual flowers goes to Anita Ramasastri, who coordinated the preparations, which I think turned out to be a lot more work than she had anticipated, and for accepting to be with us today, even though it's still in the middle of the night in Seattle where she lives. And my very special thanks also go to all the other five members of the coordinating committee. I also wish to thank UNOC and the Secretariat for their efforts in making this uh, meeting possible. In spite of many tests, unfortunately, no other platform turned out to be sufficiently reliable yet. So we're using Zoom exceptionally for this meeting and we very much regret that the technical difficulties couldn't really be sorted out. So we don't have interpretation today but I promise um, that we will do everything possible to sort this out in the very near future. Your Excellencies, dear colleagues, as I have mentioned in the past, I have made a hobby of collecting good human rights stories because I think that the council should not only focus on deficits, it should also be aware and share what has been achieved for the benefits of human rights. And as we already saw during our informal event with the High Commission on the 9th of April, the COVID-19 crisis, despite its devastating impact in different parts of the world, has actually triggered a number of uplifting stories of solidarity and bravery. 
Let me mention a few examples. The crisis showed, for example, that having a safe home can be central to human survival, but not everybody has a safe home. So these last weeks have seen moratoria on evictions due to rental and mortgage arrears. We have seen deferrals of mortgage payments. We've seen extensions of winter moratoria for evictions of informal settlements, youth hostels being repurposed, and even hotel rooms being adapted for homeless people. We have also seen governments improve access to water and sanitation, including to informal settlements, some of them even moratoria for payments. We have seen countries do everything to preserve jobs, provide or extend a paid sick leave or unemployment benefits. We've seen states provide childcare for essential service workers, and we have seen special measures to expand the domestic violence responses for victims of abuse. Following statements by the Special Rapporteur on Disabilities, sign language has been included in many of the COVID-19 announcements, and various states have started to release from detention centers in response to the COVID outbreak. We can hope that these developments might be a first start to what the Secretary General invited us all to do, which is to build back a better post-pandemic world. And he also reminded us that human rights can and must guide the COVID-19 response and recovery. With all of this in mind, I would now like to briefly turn to some housekeeping before we start the discussion. Mm -hmm. And the housekeeping is, the modalities of participation in this meeting will be the same as for the virtual information, informal discussion we had with the High Commissioner on the 9th of April. So before giving the floor to the mandate holders, we will proceed with the registration for the list of speakers now. I would like to invite representatives from states wishing to deliver a statement to press the raise hand button now at the bottom of their screen. And if you had already raised your hand before, this would have been um, lowered again by the, mod by the moderators, by the technicians, co-hosts, so please do it now. And please note that only one person per delegation should press the raise the hand button, and that should be the person who will actually deliver the statement. Based on the order of registration, while the mandate holders will make their presentations, the Secretariat will draw up a list of speakers, which I will then use for the discussion. NGO representatives will be given the possibility to take the floor at a slightly later stage. Uh, those of them who wish to take the floor are kindly requested to send an email to an address which has been given to you before, which is hrcngo at ohchr.org. And I repeat, hrcngo at ohchr.org. Since our meeting will be limited, we ask delegations to keep their interventions short and please refrain from asking questions which have already been answered before. Having said that, I now have the pleasure of handing over the floor to Mrs. Anita Ramazastri for her presentation. A very good, very early morning to you in Seattle. You have the floor. Thank you very much, Madam President. Madam President, Your Excellencies, distinguished delegates, civil society representatives, ladies and gentlemen, good morning from Seattle. It is indeed very early here, but I thank the Human Rights Council and the President for the invitation to speak with you today in this informal dialogue. I'm not wearing my individual mandate hat today, but instead come as a representative of special procedures. As chair of the coordination committee, I'm pleased to represent the collective and powerful voice of special procedures and the mandates contained therein. I also want to thank my colleagues on the coordination committee. In addition to Danius Puras here with me today, I want to thank Victor Madrigal, Javed Rahman, Lee Toomey and Clement Boulay for their hard work in preparing for this dialogue and preparing the document that you have seen today. And my thanks as well to all of the mandate holders who provided their inputs, insights, and joined in our own dialogues about how COVID-19 impacts our work and the need to act urgently and with unwavering commitment in the name of human rights. We have a number of colleagues who will be leaving their mandates tomorrow on the 1st of May. 
Thank you for your tremendous work over the past six years, but also for your quick acts to address the pandemic in the last month. In preparation for this dialogue, the Coordination Committee has created spaces for exchange of information and experiences between mandate holders, a process that has included a series of activities. To date, the Coordination Committee has worked with the Special Procedures Branch to create a dedicated COVID-19 page. If you looked at that page today, you will see that it is now organized and structured to parallel the document that we have prepared for you today. We hope that over time, this will be a living repository of guidance, guidelines, and recommendations for states and examples of good practice for all of us to share. We have tracked all official actions by mandate holders and categorized them into thematic clusters. I will note, of course, that there are additional activities that many mandate holders have taken from dialogues individually with states and other stakeholders, but we have focused on official actions in our uh, document and remarks today. We have based uh, on our analysis of mandate activities and prepared an analytical compilation of statements and advice. And we have hosted online meetings for mandate holders, which were held on the 22nd and 23rd of April, attended by 51 mandate holders. We have also engaged in several rounds of written consultations. Owing to the mandate holders commitment and dedication to the process, the coordination committee has been able to facilitate the identification of key common concerns and messages and a reference tool for the findings and advice addressed to states and other stakeholders. I'm therefore happy that we were able to share with you today a working document entitled United Nations Special Procedures and COVID-19, which reflects public actions taken by mandate holders until the 28th of April. In addition, an information note and flyer showing all special procedures actions at a glance have also been shared with you. I understand that these documents have been posted on the Human Rights Council extranet. As we have all been gripped by the pandemic in addressing this unprecedented crisis, please know that mandate holders have risen to the challenge. Their powerful statements, actions, and innovations represent a, an a, a attempt to deal with the, uh, the idea that we need a human rights-based approach to address the, this crisis. And this is our key message for everyone today. Let me begin with a snapshot of what mandate holders have done to date. To date, we have accomplished the following. The first COVID-19 press release was issued on the 16th of March, 2020. And since then, special procedures have issued 45 statements and press releases in total, of which 29 have been issued individually and 16 collectively. Madam President, you referred to one in particular where 60 uh, mandate holders signed on collectively, and I'll reflect some of those uh, recommendations shortly. We also have what we call human rights dispatches. On the 2nd of April 2020, the Special Rapporteur on Extrajudicial Summary or Arbitrary Killings issued her first human rights dispatch on police use of force and the lethal, lethal force in states of emergency. In her thorough guidance, she notes that while COVID-19 is new, the applicable human rights norms are not. The principles of legality, necessity, proportionality, and precaution applied to the rights of life must be implemented. Mandate holders have also issued open letters and, and also key principles relating to COVID-19 in an attempt to help states to ensure human rights consistent actions as they engage in policy and decision making during the crisis. The Special Rapporteur on Adequate Housing has released, for example, five guidance notes on COVID-19 and the right to housing as follows the protection of residents of informal settlements, the protection of people living in homelessness, the protection of renters and mortgage payers, the prohibition on evictions, and the financialization in the future. Each guidance note has an accompanying explainer video of two minutes to capture different audiences in use with the media. In her own words, housing has become the frontline defense against the coronavirus. Home has rarely been more of a life or death situation. From strong admissions, ad, admonitions to practical advice, the Special Rapporteur notes that states need, for example, to provide a temporary housing for those who have fallen into homelessness during this crisis. On the 27th of March, 2020, the Independent Expert on Sexual Orientation and Gender Identity issued an open letter on main trends of disparate impact of COVID-19 and LGBT, LGBT communities around the world and sought advice and input on COVID-19 specific impact. On the 14th of April, 2020, the Special Rapporteur on the Rights to Freedom of Peaceful Assembly and Association issued 10 key principles for human rights compliant responses to COVID-19. I mentioned these, but there are many more in the document which illustrate that these types of recommendations and guidance tools provide good blueprints for states on a wide range of topics. On the 30th of March, 2020, the Special Rapporteur for the Protection and Promotion of Human Rights while Countering Terrorism 
provided an online-based tracker that monitors COVID-19 state responses affecting civic freedoms and human rights and specifically monitors emergency powers emerging across the globe. The tracker was developed by the mandate in partnership with other global partners. And again, this is an innovative tool that states and other stakeholders can use to understand the impact of this rapidly evolving crisis and how states are responding. We also have examples of outreach. The Special Rapporteur on Violence Against Women recently issued a call for submissions dealing with the causes and consequences on the increase of gender-based violence against women and domestic violence in the context of the COVID-19 crisis. Both the Special Rapporteur on Violence Against Women and the Working Group on Discrimination Against Women have identified impacts of the pandemic on women and girls in their work and shown how both stay-at-home orders as well as frontline work have led to disproportionate human rights impacts for women. Some mandate holders have engaged in innovative campaigns using different channels of communication. The Special Rapporteur on Contemporary Forms of Racism, Racial Discrimination, Xenophobia, and Related Intolerance issued the podcast Entre Entrepreneurs of Intolerance Compound COVID-19 Racist Backlash, again, using another form of communication to get out her message. The Special Rapporteur on Water and Sanitation has issued a video campaign composed of three videos focused on hand washing, access to sanitation, as a measure to prevent disease, including COVID-19, and water and gender equality. In addition, collectively or individually, special procedures have continued examining allegations of human rights violations or concerns through the communication procedure. We have so far issued 29 letters related to concerns uh, directly uh, connected to COVID-19 or the measures adopted in the context of the pandemic. And finally, in terms of what else we have done, Several mandate holders are planning to focus one of their upcoming reports to the Human Rights Council or the General Assembly on issues relating to COVID-19. The report of the Special Rapporteur on Freedom of Expression to the upcoming session of the Council on Disease Pandemics and the Freedom of Opinion and Expression is already available. These are illustrations of our body of work. I also now want to briefly share with you some key messages and observations from mandate holders as well. As I mentioned before, one of the key messages we wish to share with you is our unwavering belief that a human rights-based approach is essential to addressing this pandemic and the recovery that will follow. Mandate holders have emphasized the critical need for a human rights-based approach to COVID-19. The document we prepared and the different rights which have been impacted are themselves powerful as evidence of the need for states to consider multiple dimensions when acting to protect uh, public health. Special procedures have called on states to put human rights at the center of the pandemic response. In their same message, the one that was joined by 60 mandate holders, special procedures advise that the principles of non-discrimination, participation, empowerment, and accountability need to be applied to all health-related policies. Special procedures advises that the right to dignity requires that all persons under their authority should enjoy equality of access to health services and equality of treatment. With this, I also want to underscore that special procedures believes that non-discrimination is a critical principle to be applied during this time. Special procedures have emphasized this vital principle of non-discrimination in terms of how access to healthcare services and life-saving treatment are so vital at this time. Special procedures recognize that as COVID-19 spreads, efforts should be focused on slowing down its spread, ensuring that the most vulnerable people receive the protection and care they are entitled to. Preventing the spread of this virus requires outreach to all and ensuring equitable and non-discriminatory access to information, prevention, medical care and treatment for all persons, irrespective of their citizenship, nationality, or migratory status. To treat and combat the spread of COVID-19 effectively, individuals must have access to accurate health advice and sufficient health care information without fear of discrimination. Special procedures advise that authorities must speedily address any evidence of racism, xenophobia, and bigotry during the pandemic, whether it occurs in the differential treatment by authorities during healthcare delivery, through the imposition of restrictions, through attacks in social media and other forums towards individuals accused of being infected, or through other means, discrimination and racism must be combated by reliable public information and by strong statements opposing it. While mandate holders have emphasized the vital principle of non-discrimination, they also would like to underscore another powerful message. This is that the pandemic is highlighting and exacerbating systemic inequalities. 
The current crisis and its aftermath have added further stresses and perils to those who may be living in poverty or are more at risk due to structural inequalities in our societies. My state, Washington, was one of the earliest to experience the COVID-19 outbreak here in the US. From factory workers here on assembly lines who may not be able to socially distance to workers who deliver packages to home healthcare workers, every day people on the front lines are at greater risk for contracting coronavirus here and I imagine everywhere else that we are gathered. I can pay someone $5, a mere $5 tip for them to deliver my groceries to me so I can shelter at home. They risk their lives to shop for me so that I can stay home and stay safe. Many governments' response to COVID-19 have had devastating effects on people in poverty, as the UN Special Rapporteur on Poverty, Extreme Poverty has noted. Despite often far-reaching policy reversals and huge financial support packages, the most vulnerable have been shortchanged or excluded. The Special Rapporteur on, on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities has noted that accommodation measures are essential to enable people with disabilities to reduce contacts and the risk of contamination. But she also underscores that access to additional financial aid is also vital to reduce the risk of people with disabilities and their families falling into greater vulnerability or poverty. As she explains, many people with disabilities depend on services that have been suspended and may not have enough money to stockpile food and medicine or afford the extra cost of home deliveries. The independent expert on the right of, rights of older persons has highlighted the inequality around care for older persons. She expresses concern that decisions around the allocation of scarce medical resources, such as ventilators and intensive care units, may be, may be made solely on the basis of age, denying older persons the right to health and life on an equal basis with others. Finally, the working group of, of experts on people of African descent call on member states to commit to equity in the current public health crisis and to recognize the current risk of the historical exploitation of the bodies and resources of people of African descent posed to decision-making today, including driving racial disparities in access to healthcare and treatment. Structural racial discrimination may further exacerbate inequality in access to healthcare and treatment, leading to racial disparities in health outcomes and increased mortality and morbidity for people of African descent. Uh, addressing this crisis is more than that. States must take additional social protection measures so that their support reaches those who are at most at risk of being disproportionately affected by the crisis. This includes women who are already at a disadvantaged socioeconomic position, position bear an even heavier care burden, and live with the heightened risk of gender-based violence. Finally, here, in, in terms of inequality, special procedures expresses concern that shortages in critical protective equipment continue to be a grave concern for doctors, nurses, emergency first responders, and other medical professionals working on the front lines of the global fight against the coronavirus pandemic in nearly all countries battling the virus. A particular concern is the inequality in the distribution of ne necessary personal protective equipment within and between states. In all of their findings and advice, the mandate holders recognize the unprecedented nature of COVID-19 and the challenges and risks that come with it. In particular, we have given attention to the conditions guiding the adoption of extraordinary measures to protect the health and well being of the population. Among some of the best practices identified in the process of design and adoption of measures, do consultation to the extent possible, ensuring equitable and non discriminatory access to information, and most importantly, medical care and treatment for all. The risks include the exacerbation of intolerance and hate, speech, and crimes and the vulnerabilities of particular populations and communities. A great number of our recommendations revolve around the criteria to examine the legality and legitimacy of emergency measures. Several mandate holders have remarked on increased reports of excessive use of force, police killings, restrictions on civil society organizations, and reports of domestic violence. As a matter of fact, great concern exists for cases in which governments have passed sweeping emergency laws Delayed, plans, uh, delayed planned elections, or followed a trend to militarize the crisis. In many of these instances, the measures appear to be aimed at purposes other than addressing the health crisis, including the quashing of opposition voices. Read together, our statements must allow the conclusion that emergency measures must be guided by the purpose of safeguarding life with due attention to the notions of human dignity and personal integrity, without attention to which the reaction against the pandemic would not serve a useful purpose. In particular, 
Mandate holders have identified practical guidelines to illustrate this framework, in particular that the prohibitions against arbitrary deprivation of life, torture, and other ill treatment is absolute and non-derogable. The, the demand that the use of force be guided by the principles of legality, necessity, proportionality, and precaution, and the requirement that any restrictions on human rights, such as access to health services or freedom of movement must be strictly justified, proportionate, and should only be curtailed for a length of time, no longer than necessary, and in a non-discriminatory manner. I should note that mandate holders have cautioned that seemingly neutral laws have had disproportionate impacts on various groups and populations. Many populations, for example, may lack access to clean water for sanitation or hand washing. Requirements to stay at home may not be feasible if someone needs to seek access to resources such as food or to earn a livelihood. Mandate holders have pointed out that when neutral policies enacted in the name of public health have had unfortunate consequences for different groups in terms of how the uh, various orders lead to deprivation of human rights. My colleague, Danius Porus, will address this further, but I will provide just a few examples. Special procedures recognize the increased risk, increased risk of domestic violence against women during lockdowns and the need to ensure access to protection measures, including restraining orders, safe shelters, and helplines for victims. Special procedures have also noted that when governments have shut down entire countries without making even minimal efforts to ensure people can get by, that after they have pushed millions inside without a plan, some governments have then responded with gratuitous and counterproductive violence to low-income people who were forced to leave their homes in order to survive. I will close now by noting that mandate holders have also welcomed good practices by states. Special procedures welcome the decisions adopted by some states to grant temporary residency rights, including access to social and health benefits, to migrants, including asylum seekers, amid the fight against the pandemic. Special Procedures has welcomed that some states have recently taken exemplary initiatives by re to reduce overcrowding in prisons and other detention settings by promoting early release and reducing the intake of prisoners with a view to protecting the health of prisoners and staff. We hope that as our work continues, we, we see emergent good practice that can be highlighted and recommended for consideration by other states. I would be remiss in not emphasizing that the need for states to act transparently during this crisis is imperative. People everywhere need to know of the risk that exists globally as well as locally. While the masks we now wear may be disposable, the lives of people are not. I thank you again, Madam President, and look forward to the dialogue today. This meeting is being recorded. Thank you very much. Uh... Madam Chairperson of the Coordinating Committee for this very comprehensive overview of the vast work which has been done by the entirety of stakeholders. And I now have the pleasure of handing over the floor to Mr. Daniel Spouras, who used to be the president of the Coordinating Committee and still continues as a member of the Coordinating Committee, but in addition also happens to be very usefully Special Rapporteur on the right of everyone to the enjoyment of the highest possible standards of physical and mental health. You have the floor, sir. Madam President, distinguished delegates, representatives of civil society, ladies and gentlemen, greetings from Vilnius. I will now continue representing this huge work, special procedures, uh, mandate holders I have done during these several weeks when the world is facing COVID-19 pandemic. We have joined forces to coordinate human rights action, which is, we believe, uh, important now more than ever. Advances in biomedical sciences are very important to realize the right to health and also during this pandemic, but equally important are human rights, the principles of non-discrimination, participation, empowerment, and accountability need to be applied to all policies. This is the way to effectively manage response to pandemic. And this is why we, Special Procedures Mandate Holders, expect that today's conversation will be one step forward to the commitment from all of us who are bound to human rights-based approach, Human Rights Council, Office of High Commissioner of Human Rights, Special Procedures, Civil Society, all member states, so that there is more mutual understanding and trust and more agreement than ever on how this unprecedented crisis should be managed and how it should not be managed. Um, I remember as a former chair of coordinating committee, good joint efforts to address uh, what we call New York Geneva gap 
and to strengthen synergy between three pillars, peace and security, development, human rights. Crisis like this is a real opportunity for re revitalization of these good ideas and to translate in concrete terms the fact that human rights should be mainstreaming in all United Nations actions. This crisis gives us also opportunity to concretize the call to action on human rights that the Secretary General launched at the beginning of March by ensuring that human rights are indeed central to the response to COVID-19. All mandate holders have been raising during these weeks as pandemic emerged uh, very important issues and uh, uh, on, on measures so that they have been applied globally. I will touch upon some specific responses and specific groups and vulnerable situations. First, all these emergency measures, they, yes, they, they need to be in place. And we agree that evidence-based measures, also those that restrict rights and freedoms are needed to protect health now. Testing, contact tracing, isolation, quarantine, this is needed. However, all measures need to be proportionate and non-discriminatory and limited in time and purpose. Mandate holders have raised concerns over measures that discriminate certain groups and have other purpose and are used in the guise of protecting health. And this is unacceptable. And then we say now, stay home. And what about 1.8 billion people who live in homelessness situation or in grossly inadequate housing? How can we require physical distancing from people who live in overcrowded conditions? And how can we uh, blame or penalize them for violating the rules? So these are questions which we all are raising and looking for answers. Access to reliable and accurate information is of utmost importance. Pandemic can be managed effectively only with truthful information. The right to freedom of expression, right to seek, receive, impart information and uh, ideas applies to everyone. This is important for protection of health because if information is diverted from truth, uh, so one of negative effects will be spread of conspiracy theories and fake news, and this can be detrimental to, to health. Right to privacy needs to be protected. Again, use of technologies can be used for tracking the spread of the virus. But we urge, we amended holders urge that any use of such technologies abide by the strictest protection, protection so that there are safeguards and these technologies are limited in use in terms of time and, and focus and purpose. Uh, many issues have been raised by mental holders on availability of medical equipment to save lives of patients, COVID-19 patients, and to save health lives uh, of healthcare workers when they need uh, personal protection equipment. We express our gratitude and admiration to health workers around the world who heroically battle the outbreak. They face huge workloads, risk their own lives, and are forced to face painful ethical dilemmas when resources are too scarce. Healthcare workers need to have all possible support from states, business, media, public at large, from all of us. On the right to association and assembly, I mean, yes, right to assembly is now restricted, but in the workplace, uh, uh, there is a right to assembly when people work, this has to do also with the need to foster mutual trust and understanding between authorities and people, trade, trade unions, civil society. Effective management of pandemic requires vibrant civil society and good health can be promoted only with active participation from people and with their empowerment. What we do not recommend is using force, shrinking space for civil society, militarization of measures. Some ways on financial stimuli and similar measures. Mandate holders express concern that so-called saving economy at any costs can be harmful. This approach is often accompanied by a lack of serious efforts to reduce inequalities. Our view is that fiscal stimulus and social protection packages aimed at those least able to cope with the crisis are essential to mitigating the devastating consequences of the pandemic. Governments might consider the introduction of an emergency universal basic income. And uh, many good recommendations uh, have been uh, presented by mandate holders on financial aid. 
issues, on business and human rights. This global health and economic crisis is an unprecedented test for governments and businesses not to lower human rights standards, and we urge them not to cut corners in the push for economic growth. It is vital to protect workers who are most vulnerable to abuse and loss of livelihood. Now, I will want to, to uh, tell something about specific groups, communities, populations. First of all, response during crisis and during recovery, which will come, needs to be gender sensitive. Uh, special procedures find that women are particularly exposed with many on the front lines in, in the COVID-19 fight providing essential medical, uh, medical and other services, keeping communities running and taking care of families. The disproportionate share of women's care responsibilities due to cultural stereotypes on gender roles within the family has increased significantly effective, affecting the physical and mental health. States should provide universal health care for all women and girls including uninterrupted access to a full range of sexual and reproductive health services. Children may be affected by pandemic, maybe not that much by virus, but by many measures that are applied, including because when schools are closed, it's not only about right to education. Many people, many children have been receiving meals only when they go to school. So we have to take care of their right to food and also staying home in an environment when the children often can maybe not protect from, from violence and, and different forms of child abuse. Um, the chair uh, of coordinating committee already raised serious issues of rights of persons with disabilities. They should not be left behind during this crisis and should not be discriminated when it comes to healthcare services, including life-saving in interventions. Special procedures express concern by immense challenges that persons with disabilities are experiencing due, due to emergency measures, which have resulted in the disruption of support networks essential for their survival. The rise of discriminatory triage protocols that restrict access to healthcare and life-saving measures, including ventilators. And also uh, a lot of concerns about uh, people with disabilities who are institutionalized who are in uh, psychiatric and other facilities that have become hotspots of the pandemic where 40 or even 50 percent of fatalities take place older persons they are especially vulnerable not only because the virus touches touches these groups more often they may be affected by loneliness poverty neglect whether at home or in nursing homes Special procedures find that older persons do not only face disproportionate risk of death, but they are further threatened by COVID-19 due to their care support needs or by living in high risk environments such as institutions. Many good recommendations um, are presented by mandate holders on the rights of uh, people on the move, migrants, uh, refugees, asylum seekers, also internally displaced uh, persons. Mandate holders have raised concerns over the situation of minorities, people from African descent, yeah. LGBT and gender diverse persons, persons who use drugs, persons deprived of liberty, persons in institutional care. These are all different groups with different needs, facing different challenges. However, the common denominator is that they may be suffering disproportionately, especially by discriminatory attitudes. And if these discriminatory attitudes and actions based on them prevail in policies and practices, these people will be suffering, but not only them. The effectiveness of containing the epidemic will suffer, public health of general population will suffer, and we should know from other epidemics, such as AIDS epidemic and other public health disasters, that split of the disease is fueled by discrimination, poverty, inequalities, xenophobia, violence, and these are all now allies of the coronavirus, coronavirus. And when we are united now, and I have a common goal to end COVID-19 pandemic, we should implement not only emergency public health measures, isolation, quarantine, physical distancing, yes, these are necessary, but that will be not enough. There are other measures needed. 
These are solidarity, mutual understanding, respect and trust, participation, empowerment of people, equality and social justice, accountability and political leadership to promote human rights as a powerful tool. These measures are not in contradiction to emergency public health measures. These are also public health measures in modern understanding of public health, and this I can say convincingly as a mandate holder, a special rapporteur on the right to health. Synergy between these two sets of measures, emergency measures and human rights-based approach, this is the way to defeat pandemic and to mitigate negative consequences of this crisis. Mandate holders welcome good examples of such synergies in many countries. But all, all, although we remain concerned that there are many actions when human rights are undermined. Madam President, COVID-19 is a serious global challenge, but as you told in the beginning, is a wake-up call for the revitalization of universal human rights principles and two sets of very good principles, evidence-based, what science tells, and uh, human rights-based approach. We all together face this unprecedented challenge. Only with concerted multilateral efforts, solidarity and mutual trust will we defeat the pandemic while becoming more resilient, mature and united. And I would like to conclude by stressing then that in addition to the immediate reaction and recommendations on how to deal with crisis today, mandate holders uh, are already looking into future and the consequences of the crisis and in the lessons that we should learn moving forward. And just uh, several of our colleagues have already shared some thoughts on future, I mean, medium and long-term recovery. And one of these observations is like this. Special procedures observe that the year prior to the current crisis was marked by unprecedented wave of protests around the world. While the demands and concerns of the protesters differed from context to context, protesters consistently called for more democratic governance, greater respect for human rights, increased equality uh, uh, and uh, to austerity and meaningful steps to combat climate change and widespread corruption. The current crisis is unlikely to alleviate these demands. If anything, the economic downturn caused by the crisis combined with financial measures that enhance inequality will only serve to exacerbate underlying causes. It is vital in this context that states' responses to the crisis take citizens' demands fully into account and that states take measures to adopt more democratic governance structures, to enhance rights protection and fulfillment, to reduce inequality and to ensure that the transition to greener and more sustainable energy sources receives increased support and attention. Special procedure notes that three quarters of emerging infectious diseases are so-called zoonoses, meaning they jump from wild or domesticated animals into humans. This includes Ebola, SARS, MERS, and now COVID-19. A range of environmentally damaging human activities raise the risk of future zoonotic diseases. To reduce the catastrophic risks posed by zoonoses will require an end to deforestation, limiting the destruction of natural wildlife habitat, clamping down on illegal wildlife trade, urgently addressing climate change and making changes to industrial agriculture, intensive livestock operation and human diets. Finally, I would like to conclude by stressing that all recommendations and advice issued by mandate holders have also a clear preventive role. If the advice and recommendations of mandate holders are followed and integrated in our response to COVID-19, a lot of potential human rights violations could be avoided. I would encourage all of you to consider them in the perspective and global community will be much more effective and successful in managing the response to this crisis if these recommendations of mandate holders are taken seriously. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Puras. Uh, and I will now turn to the list of speakers and start with the joint statements uh, to be given by first Australia and then followed by the European Union and Denmark. Australia, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam President. I have the honour to deliver this statement on behalf of Australia, Canada, Iceland, Liechtenstein, 
New Zealand, Norway and Switzerland. Our countries recognise the importance of Human Rights Council special procedures mandate holders and support their vital work in raising awareness and promoting understanding of the human rights dimensions of the COVID-19 pandemic and advancing implementation of human rights worldwide. We urge all states to cooperate with and assist mandate holders in the performance of their tasks. During this time of crisis, when it is essential states comply with their international human rights obligations, special procedures mandate holders offer an independent and constructive voice to all states by holding them to account, helping them to improve their human rights record and identify global issues that require cooperation among states. We appreciate the flexibility in working methods that mandate holders employ to accommodate states managing COVID-19 response priorities. We also encourage continued cooperation and intensified coordination between and amongst mandates in carrying out joint reports or studies on intersectional, on intersectional issues. Our countries condemn any attempts to intimidate or conduct reprisals against individuals or groups who are engaged with special procedures mandate holders, as well as with the mandate holders themselves. We would be interested in hearing from the two panelists whether there have been any cases of reprisals against mandate holders or human rights defenders and others working with them on the human rights issues related to COVID-19. Thank you, Madam President. Thank you very much. And I now give the floor to the European Union. Thank you, uh, Madam President. And in the name of the European Union, allow me to thank you for organizing this informal conversation. And of course, allow me to thank also Mrs. Ramasastri and Mr. Puras for being uh, with us today. Let me be clear, human rights cannot be forgotten in times of crisis. And just to echo the Secretary General and also the High Commissioner, Human rights need to be front and center as we respond to the virus. And I'm very glad that the council was able to hold a rich dialogue last week or a few weeks ago with the high commissioner. And this conversation again is yet another indication that the human rights system is functioning and shifting gear to be able indeed to perform its indispensable work in these difficult uh, times. Also in the light of the secretary general's call uh, to action, it is vital that human rights that the human rights machinery, including the Council's mechanisms, are active in ensuring uh, guidance to states on how to respond to COVID-19 in a way that adheres to their obligations on the international law, including, in particular, also human rights law. As part of its own response, the European Union will continue to promote and uphold good governance, human rights, the rule of law, gender equality, non-discrimination, decent work conditions, as well as all other fundamental values and humanitarian principles. We very much welcome the guidance by the Office of the High Commissioner uh, to states on how to ensure that the response measures are in full compliance with their human rights obligations. Equally, the treaty bodies and the special procedures have, in a string of statements and communications, assisted states in their efforts to respond to the pandemic in a way that respects and protects and fulfills also human rights. Mrs. Ramasastri and Mr. Puras, you know that the European Union is a very strong supporter of the special procedures, and your guidance is instrumental in ensuring that, human rights, that there is a human rights-based approach to COVID-19. With this in mind, I would like to ask you the following questions, first of all, to Mrs. Ramasastri, and partly you have already responded to that. But in a number of communications, the special procedures have drawn attention to the emergency measures, not answering indeed the requirements of being necessary, proportionate, non-discriminatory and time limited. So will there be any kind of a follow-up on these situations from your side in the future? And Mr. Puras, could you elaborate on the uh, implementation and implications of the COVID-19 for states' fulfillment of their core obligations related to the right to health? And what kind of special measures you see indeed necessary in this respect to ensure compliance with the principles of non-discrimination and equality? I thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ambassador. I now give the floor for Den to Denmark. 
to be followed by Chile and then the Republic of Korea. You have the floor. Madam President, I have the honor of delivering this statement on behalf of the Nordic Baltic countries. It's Estonia, Finland, Iceland, Latvia, Lithuania, Norway, Sweden, and my own country, Denmark. Madam President, we thank you for organizing this meeting. We welcome the opportunity to engage with special procedures, mandate holders, and thank them for, the, uh, 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 them for, for their important work uh, on the human rights impacts of the COVID-19 crisis. The pandemic poses uh, far-reaching threats to, to all human rights. Different countries are now entering different phases of the pandemic. Some are starting to ease uh, emergency restrictions, while others are uh, extending um, extraordinary measures. In either case, states must ensure measures are proportionate, time-bound, uh, prescribed by law, and be guided by the principles of uh, non-discrimination, democracy, gender equality, uh, and the rule of law. Access to information, including through free, independent, and pluralistic media is crucial to alleviate the impacts of the crisis. COVID-19 is a global uh, public health emergency posting, uh, posing unprecedented challenges. The virus does not discriminate, but its impacts do. It has exposed weaknesses in the delivery of public health services and inequalities that impede access to them, particularly for persons in vulnerable situations, including persons with disabilities, indigenous peoples, minorities, migrants, refugees, uh, people in conflict zones, LGBTI persons, and older persons. We particularly see increased impacts of the pandemic on women and girls' rights, including sexual and reproductive health and rights. Women are disproportionately exposed with many uh, on the front, line, front lines of the fight against COVID-19. As health facilities are overburdened and supply chains disrupted, women and girls face restrictions on the provision of essential health services, including access to sexual and reproductive health services. UNFPA estimates that 31 million additional sexual and gender-based violence cases can be expected during this period. Lockdowns also increases the risk of violence and exploitation of children. During this unprecedented crisis, we remain fully committed to gender equality and SRHR. SRHR is key to ensure women and girls full and equal enjoyment of all human rights. We stress the importance of ensuring all actions taken in response to the crisis are gender responsive and strongly support the Secretary General's call to make gender equality and the prevention of redress of violence against women and girls a key part of national response plans to COVID-19. Distinguished speakers, uh, in your view, how do states best ensure that women and girls' rights, especially SIHR, are protected during this time of crisis, both in our own, uh, in the short-term responses, but also in the long-term? I thank you so much. Thank you very much, Ambassador, and I now give the floor to Chile. Thank you, Madam President, to convene this informal meeting and to the experts for their presentations. We congratulated the special procedures for their coordination and work carried out since the beginning of the crisis. Statements and guidelines on human rights issues related with the crisis are valid. The COVID-19 is posing many challenges to states to ensure the protection and promotion of human rights while taking effective measures to stop the pandemic. In this regard, all efforts of the special procedures to help states delivering concrete guidelines to comply with human rights obligations are appreciated. In Chile, from the beginning of the crisis, we have focused on ensuring protection of persons deprived of liberty and children in residential centers. In both cases, a prevention protocol has been established to avoid internal contagious and to ensure the contact of prisoners with outside by video conference. Furthermore, Following various recommendations from human rights experts, we adopted a law to commute prison to house arrest, in particular for persons older than 65 and pregnant women. Another area of concern has been the protection of women and children from domestic violence, which can be exacerbated in time of confinement. 
our goal has been to ensure the continuity of psychological services for victims of gender violence and reinforce channels for complaint. We are aware that the crisis is far from being overcome and therefore more than ever, it is necessary to coordinate multilateral efforts to support all states to better face the health, economic and social challenges of the pandemic, always ensuring the protection of human rights. While many states are in the process of to implement opening measures, the use of tracking technologies for infected people has emerged as an alternative. In this sense, we would like to know, as a question to the experts, the opinion of them in relation of the use of these digital tools in relations of the right of privacy. Finally, we invite all special procedures mandate holders to continue coordinating to deliver information and concrete and practical guidelines to the states, identifying the good practices adopted in countries. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ambassador. I now give the floor to the Republic of Korea to be followed by Venezuela, Belgium, and then Italy. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, first of all, the Republic of Korea thanks the special procedures for their active engagement during the unprecedented COVID-19 crisis. We especially appreciate special procedures continued efforts to raise awareness of the increased risks for vulnerable and marginalized groups, including older persons, detainees, persons with disabilities, homeless people, women, and children. By being a voice for the voiceless, joint statements and recommendations put forth by human rights experts can bring renewed attention to our time-honored human rights norms and principles as a navigator in our united efforts to defeat this virus. It is even more so when COVID-19 is fast becoming a human rights crisis. In this light, my delegation would like to ask the following questions to the panelists. First, it is our firm belief that, that uh, regardless of its political or social system, every country must place human rights at the center in taking COVID-19 response measures as the human rights centered approach is the most efficient one. How do you think the promotion and protection of human rights benefit countries in their efforts to contain the outbreaks? Second, there seems to be trade-offs, trade-offs, at least in the short term, in our fight against COVID-19 between measures to protect our lives and those to protect our livelihoods. How would governments be able to strike a balance um, in this regard in their decision-making process and take concrete measures that are necessary and proportionate. Third, academia anticipates that the post-COVID-19 era will be characterized by a certain level of regression of globalization. What do you think um, will be the ramifications of such a phenomenon in relation to human rights and what needs to be done to preserve our human rights architecture in the post-COVID-19 world? I thank you. Thank you very much. And I now give the floor to Venezuela. I'm afraid I can't see Venezuela, but I hope we'll be able to hear you. You have the floor. Hello? Hello? Yes, we can hear you now. Oh, OK. Well, thank you, Madam President. Um, we welcome the, the organization of this virtual meeting, and we appreciate the presentations made. However, we regret that other special procedures directly involved in the crisis have not been convened to this conversation, such as the special rapporteurs on unilateral coercive measures on human rights of migrants and on foreign debt, among others. Today, the world faces the tannic chain challenge of a pandemic, and only international solidarity and cooperation and a strategy with a multilateral approach can guarantee that we can combat it effectively. Internally, the Venezuelan state has taken proactive and urgent measures to protect our people against contagion and threat the infector, the infected, with the final objective of safeguarding the right life and our people and the right to physical and mental health. In the international arena, President Nicolás Maduro has strengthened ties of cooperation, exchanged strategies, coordinated efforts, 
and carried out effective actions jointly with other states to confront the COVID-19 pandemic. Unfortunately, our efforts are limited by the imposition of illegal unilateral coercive measures against our country and others, with dire consequences in, in, in many vital sectors, essential to give an effective response to the COVID-19 crisis, and impeding all efforts for cooperation, solidarity, and multilateralism. Madam President, in this unfortunate, unfortunate selfish context, context, certain governments have insisted on depriving economic interest in the face of loss of human rights of human life, ignoring the recommendation of the WHO and have not taken the appropriate measures to ensure prevention and social distancing, with, which has deepened the spread of the virus and human suffering. COVID-19 has generated outbreaks of xenophobia and discrimination against migrants and other vulnerable minorities. And in some countries, even medical personnel have suffered from discrimination. We ask to the special procedures mandate holders, what actions are credit carried out by the special procedures to follow up on complaints about xenophobia and discrimination in the context of COVID-19? Two, what actions must the international community take to compel the lifting of illegal and criminal unilateral coercive measures in progress? Three, what actions are the special procedures mandate holders of this council taking to influence the conduct and policies of the states that impose these measures that fragrantly violate human rights. Venezuela once again ratifies its willingness to cooperate and dialogue with all the mechanisms and special procedures of the Human Rights Council on the basis of objectivity, impartiality, and non-selectivity. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, I now give the floor to Belgium, followed by Italy and then Indonesia. Thank you very much, dear Chair, dear Madame Ramasastri and Mr. Puras, dear colleagues. In these times of global and multidimensional crisis, where no aspect of society is untouched, we are lucky. We are lucky to have a UN human rights machinery with independent mandate holders to keep us to account and to help us out. And that is exactly what the special procedures mandate holders have been doing, and they deserve our respect and gratitude. They have Belgium's full support, and we continue to look forward to their guidance and advice on how to adopt the human rights approach in addressing this crisis. But, dear colleagues, we are also unlucky. Unlucky because the Human Rights Council is only in session some 11 weeks a year and it somehow seems impossible to organize a special session at this moment in time, even virtually, and apparently for practical UNOC related reasons. My country regrets this very much because it deprives us of the possibility to collectively address the very legitimate human rights concerns pointed at by the mandate holders. And coming back to the special procedures, Madame Ramasastri, Mr. Puras, as we are, special procedure mandate holders are mostly confined to their own residences or offices. I would like to ask you whether it has become more difficult now to gather information on situations of concern, because indeed not all countries are equally open or transparent. And also, how you ensure that a possibly imbalanced access to information does not entail an imbalance in the attention that is given to situations of concern. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ambassador. I now give the floor to Italy to be followed by Indonesia and then China. Thank you, Madam President. Italy aligns itself with a statement delivered by the European Union. While the emergency requires to focus our attention and energies on the primary need to protect the right to life and the right to health, a human rights-based approach is necessary in order to avoid that response measures have a negative impact on the enjoyment of other fundamental rights and freedoms, deepening pre-existing inequalities and increasing discrimination and exclusion. In this respect, we are grateful to the special procedures mandate holders 
as well as to the treaty bodies and to the High Commission and her office for the guidance provided for the promotion and protection of human rights in the current difficult situation we are all going through. I would like to raise the following questions for mandate holders. In our, your view, what are the most urgent challenges that states need to address in countering COVID-19 pandemic from a human rights perspective? Could the mandate holders provide some best practice related to the promotion and protection of human rights while countering the emergency? Madam President, let me conclude by expressing my appreciations for all your efforts and the engagement of the whole Bureau in organizing this meeting, which testifies the commitment and the vitality of the Council in implementing its mandate, even in these difficult circumstances. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ambassador. And I now give the floor to Indonesia. Thank you, President, for organizing this meeting. And I thank also for your leadership, as well as the other mem member of the Bureau in these uh, difficult uh, situations. I thank also Mr. Ramasastri and Mr. Puras for their presentation. Indeed, human rights principle must prevail over the spread of misleading sources and narratives, disinformation and racism, all of which are disruptive elements that impede us from truly flattening the curve. In these tiring times, all of us must show solidarity and cooperation in saving human lives as the essence of human rights. Indonesia thanks all actors involved in this regard, particularly those involved in repatriation of our nationals. Now, the press statements and guidelines made by mandate holders on COVID-19 and human rights, as well as those made by other pertinent organizations, such as uh, the WHO and the UNODC, offer their own unique priorities. Consequently, we need to ensure coherence, especially in the implementation of those guidelines. For instance, as the Director General WHO rightly said in one of his briefings, ensuring collective security against COVID-19 would sometimes require us to sacrifice certain individual freedoms. Oftentimes, complaints regarding these restrictions made their way to mandate holders. Our question is, in the context of the mandate holders' communications, what is the current state of the verification process considering current challenges? And what can the council do more for your mandate to fully function and to ensure better coherence? Further, we should do to better utilize the obligation under Article 2 of the International Covenant on um, ECOSOC rights to garner international assistance in an improved way, particularly on access to affordable healthcare and equitable access to diagnostic, therapeutic, and vaccine of COVID-19, as well as on the progressive realizations of highest attainable standard of living. In closing, we appreciate the assistance extended by the High Commissioner and the UN Human Rights Mechanism to member states in ensuring that universal human rights principle remain to be at the core of effort to tackle COVID-19. This includes your acknowledgement to the concrete follow-up action taken by states, such as addressing the issues of prison overcrowding. I thank you, Madam President. Thank you very much. I now give the floor to China to be followed by Palestine, the Netherlands, and then the United Kingdom. You have the floor. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, I thank you for convening and uh, hosting this meeting today. And uh, I appreciate the presentations by uh, Ms. Ramasastri and Mr. Puras. Madam President, since the outbreak of uh, the pandemic uh, COVID-19, uh, uh, the, the pandemic had a serious impact on the enjoyment of human rights by people across the world. Under such circumstances, it is important that the state should give top priority to the right to life and health of the people, take seriously the negative impact of the pandemic on economic and social development, and take effective measures to guarantee the right, the social, economic, cultural rights and the right to development protecting in particular the more vulnerable communities, including women, children, 
the persons with a disability and the aged people. And it is also important that the parties concerned remove immediately the unilateral sanctions targeted on some developing countries. It is also important that all parties should resolutely oppose stigmatization and discrimination and politicization of public health issues. China has taken note of the intensive communications and statements by special procedure mandate holders recently. We hope that mandate holders have uh, carried out constructive dialogue and cooperation with governments and act in a fair and objective way in strict accordance with the mandates. Madam President, since the outbreak, the Chinese government has taken comprehensive, strict, and thorough measures as never before to contain the pandemic. This guaranteed the right to life and health by the people and other categories of human rights. We provided uh, assistance to the much needed uh, community by providing subsidi subsidies, financial subsidies and uh, temporary locations. The treatment of uh, the pandemic uh, patients were free of charge and special care was, was given to women, children, senior people, the persons with disability and poverty stricken people. Among the, high, uh, the senior patients re released from hospitals, for instance, seven were over the age of 100 years old, and the highest being an old man of uh, 108 years old. Madam President, international cooperation is essential in the combat against uh, COVID-19. China, including both the government and civil societies, have provided much needed medical assistance to more than 140 countries across and international organizations. And we have shared online and on-site information and experience with more than 150 countries. By 10th of April, China has provided more than 7.1 billion uh, face masks to various countries and uh, 56 million protective uh, units and also uh, infrared uh, thermal detector, ventilators, and goggles. We support the leading role by the World, Trade, uh, World Health Organizations and provide uh, donated uh, a total of uh, 50 million US dollars in helping developing countries to develop uh, 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 the, uh, the, the infrastructures of uh, public health. China will also donate to a global humanitarian response plan and help the countries in Africa, for instance, to uh, re release the debt burden and uh, to improve the ability to combat the uh, pandemic um, COVID-19. My question to Mr. Perth is, uh, what is the priority in addition to what you have said uh, on the next step to help the developing countries to develop uh, the capability to ensure the right to life and uh, health. Thank you. Thank you very much, China. I now give the floor to Palestine and then the Netherlands. Thank you, Madam President. And we would also like to thank the Coordination Committee of Special Procedures of their important briefing and the efforts made by all mandate holders. The State of Palestine would like to extend its sincere solidarity and convey deepest condol condolences to all bereaved families and countries on the tragic loss of life caused by COVID-19. While the entire world is fighting to overcome this pandemic and its severe effects, and while we witness in many situations the solid solidarity and the joint efforts by the international community to protect everyone in the world from this pandemic, it's our deep hope that such global cooperation and solidarity will be forthcoming and accompanied by concrete measures by the international community to uphold international law. This is a time to act to save human lives, but it's also time to stop conflict, stop human rights violation, and work together for a just peace. Regrettably, in occupied Palestine, Israel is exploiting the state of emergency and lockdown to accelerate its illegal settler colonization plans and escalate its continuous human rights violation towards Palestinians. 
This includes the continued demolition of Palestinian homes, destruction of courts, and forcible transfer of Palestinian families. In addition, the plans to annex more Palestinian lands, which is contrary to international law and a threat to peace, security, and stability in the region. In this regard, we call on special procedures, each within their mandate, to intervene to ensure the safety of Palestinians living under occupation, particularly Palestinian detainees and prisoners, and those vulnerable to the pandemic, and to provide them with proper health protection. We also urge all special procedures to call upon Israel occupying power to immediately release all prisoners, particularly those most vulnerable to COVID-19, and to cease these violations to end its illegal occupation, the privation and denial of the rights of the Palestinian people, including to self-determination in accordance with international law. And we would also like to ask, what is the special procedures doing to mitigate the effects of COVID-19 on the most vulnerable communities, including refugee communities and people under situations of armed conflict, including occupation and blocking? I thank you. Thank you very much. I give the floor to the ambassador of the Netherlands. Thank you, Madam President. The Netherlands aligns itself with the EU statements. <clears throat> I want to thank you for convening this informal Human Rights Council meeting. The promotion and protection of human rights must guide our collective response to the current global public health and economic crisis. The Human Rights Council is the highest UN forum mandated to promote and protect human rights worldwide and must have a voice in this crisis. And the Netherlands fully supports your efforts to find a way to do that and does hope UNOC supports you in your efforts. Ms. Ramasastri and Mr. Puras, let me repeat our strong support for the special procedures that constitute a crown jewel of the international human rights machinery. We have seen that many special procedures mandate holders have been extremely responsive to the current crisis. Their statements and guidance on a broad range of human rights implications are a useful tool for governments and other stakeholders to ensure a human rights-based approach in the COVID-19 response that takes into account the specific needs of vulnerable groups and individuals. Countering the global health crisis and the devastating social economic consequences worldwide is a top priority for the Netherlands. While the immediate response to the health crisis must have our full attention, we should not close our eyes to the impact of certain measures on the enjoyment of fundamental freedoms. As many mandate holders and the High Commissioner have stressed, in addressing the health crisis, it is paramount to ensure that all emergency measures and derogations are fully in compliance with international human rights standards and that such temporary restrictions meet the standards of necessity, legality and proportionality. The threat is the virus, not the people. Ms. Rama Sastri and Mr. Puras, we believe that the work that you and other mandate holders do is of critical importance. I have the following questions for you. Ms. Rama Sastri, could you elaborate on the role of business enterprises in ensuring a human rights-based approach in the COVID-19 response in these times of economic constraints? Mr. Puras, the right to health and access to healthcare is under pressure. What, in your view, is needed after this crisis to ensure that persons that currently face discrimination in healthcare systems have access to healthcare? In other words, how do we recover better? I thank you, Madam President. Thank you, Ambassador. I now give the floor to the United Kingdom to be followed by Slovenia, Egypt, and then Iran. Thank you, Madam President. We are grateful to you and members of the Coordination Committee of Special Procedures for today's meeting. Given the ongoing suspension of the Human Rights Council, we are more reliant than ever on a special procedures monitor and report on human rights violations. We wish to thank the many special rapporteurs who have continued to fulfil their mandates in a constructive and independent manner, despite the huge challenges we are all facing. You serve as a critical voice to represent those who would otherwise remain unheard, especially those within society who are the most vulnerable to violations and abuses. We welcome the speed and independence with which various mandates have responded to some extremely worrying developments in the context of national responses to coronavirus. We have two questions on two areas. Firstly, on internal coordination among the mandate holders, how is the Coordination Committee working at the moment? 
What measures are you taking to coordinate the number and frequency of statements being issued? And is there an internal dialogue among mandate holders on ensuring that human rights messages are as constructive as possible? Second, on human rights mainstreaming, what measures are you taking to encourage the wider international system factor human rights consideration into the response to the coronavirus? We are particularly interested to know how you might be able to amplify the recent report and statement on human rights by the UN Secretary General and urge these to be taken up by UN bodies and international organisations outside of the human rights system. I thank you, Madam President. Thank you very much, Ambassador, and I now give the floor to Slovenia. Thank you, Madam President. I would like to take this opportunity to thank you for your efforts to ensure that human rights stay at the forefront of our work as we address the COVID-19 pandemic. Please know also that you enjoy our unwavering support in your efforts to establish a viable online platform for formal and informal meetings of the Council during this challenging period. Slovenia has been impressed over the swift, coordinated and detail-oriented input by the special procedures of this council. We're grateful to be able to share so much useful input with our capitals in the times when many measures needed to be adopted through an untypically quick procedures. Time is of the essence in these circumstances as it is essential to act quickly to ensure efficiency and impact on public health. Unfortunately, this might sometimes unintentionally cause also negative side effects. As one of the first mechanisms in the UN human rights structure to stand up to the challenge, special procedures have shown the power of upholding principles of their work, including independence, efficiency, and good faith. Through numerous statements, special procedures have addressed specific groups and specific rights affected, as this pandemic and measures related to it will have a long-lasting impact on our societies it is becoming more apparent that their response will need to become more comprehensive as well. How do special procedures intend to coordinate on this matter in the future? And more concretely, as scientists and other health experts imply that some of the measures will need to remain in place for undetermined period of time while other measures might be slowly and gradually lifted, we would like to ask if the special procedures plan to publish any guidance on long-term measures in the wake of COVID-19. I thank you. Thank you very much. And I now give the floor to Egypt. Ambassador, you have thank, thank you very much, Madam President, for organizing this virtual meeting. And I would like also to thank Mrs. Uh, Ramasastri and Mr. Poras for their presentations. With the continuous spread of the COVID-19 pandemic in many countries, my delegation would like to reiterate and emphasize on the importance of international solidarity and cooperation to defeat such unprecedented threat to the enjoyment of human rights. And while we recognize the important contribution that the special procedures mechanism can have to achieve the promotion and protection of all human rights by maintaining a constructive international dialogue and cooperation, we are convinced that states have the primary responsibility in achieving that goal during their national responses to curb the spread of coronavirus pandemic. We believe that any engagement with the state should be guided by the principles of universality impartiality, objectivity, and non-selectivity in order to offer proposals and solutions to states in ensuring the full promotion of protection of human rights while combating the spread of coronavirus pandemic. The unprecedented impacts of the pandemic, in particular on the economic, social, and cultural rights and the right to development, especially in the developing countries, should be addressed in a timely, holistic, and integrated manner and takes into consideration not only the negative effect of different response plans and measures on human rights, but also the effects of the spread of the pandemic on human rights, including the right to life, to work, food, education, health, and access to medicine. And I would like to ask here, Madam President, what kind of measures uh, are envisaged to ease the burden of debt owed by African and other developing countries either by rescheduling, postponing payment or debt forgiveness in order to mitigate the negative consequences of the pandemic on the human rights. Thank you very much, Madam President. Sorry, sorry. 
Um, thank you very much. I now hand over the floor to the Ambassador of Iran to be followed by the Czech Republic, Canada and Pakistan. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, I thank you and uh, other colleagues for convening this timely uh, virtual meeting. Um, as I think mentioned by many colleagues, the coronavirus pandemic has put the power of humanity to the test. No one can deny the fact that only through maximum solidarity and global cooperation would we be able to overcome this scourge. As you know, Madam President, Iran is one of the countries worst hit by coronavirus, and we have made tremendous efforts in containing the spread and in treating the patients. This is all the while that our nation has been facing with negative impacts of unilateral coercive measures imposed unjustly against my country. While we appreciate all efforts and initiatives of the, of the special procedures to highlight the human rights aspects of fighting COVID-19. My delegation would like to know what initiatives and measures have been taken by special procedures uh, to advance the, the, the critical call, which has also been made by many authoritative voices, including the UNSG, Madam High Commissioners, uh, and some other special procedures to lift the unilateral sanctions? And what are the recommendations for the council to follow up on this issue? Um, I think, Madam President, it is high time that the human rights mechanisms, including the special procedures, redouble their efforts in urging for lifting of the unlawful UCM. Their continuing application are now posing a serious threat to global public health, in addition to a starkly violating fundamental human rights. I thank you, Madam President. Thank you, Ambassador. And I now give the floor to the Czech Republic. Ambassador. Thank you, Madam President. The Czech Republic aligns itself with a statement made on behalf of the EU. We welcome the opportunity to join this informal conversation. Madam President, the world is facing an unprecedented crisis. As the UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres stated recently, the COVID-19 pandemic is far more than public health emergency. It is therefore vital that our response to this crisis is based on a human rights approach. Hence, we will come and appreciate the active role of all Human Rights Council, special procedures mandate holders who have been active in making statements on a variety of issues within their expertise. They've been giving guidance for states and bringing to our attention the situation of vulnerable groups that urgently need our support. We encourage the mandate holders to continue providing these useful analysis and recommendations within their mandate. For instance, the 10 key principles identified by the Special Rapporteur on Freedoms of Association and Assembly provide a highly useful guidance. These principles include the right of civil society actors, include journalists, media workers and human rights defenders to freely seek, receive and impart information. In this context, we also appreciate the joint appeal by the Special Rapporteur on Freedom of Opinion and Expression, the OSCE Media Representative on Freedom of the Media and the IACHR Special Rapporteur for Freedom of Expression to respect and protect access to accurate and timely information offline as well as online. This Sunday, we will celebrate the World Press Freedom Day. Unfortunately, some journalists will spend it in detention for their reporting on the COVID-19 situation. Others have disappeared without a trace and remain without a trace and remain unaccounted for to this day. We strongly urge authorities to ensure a safe and enabling environment to media workers and civil society representatives. Their work helps us to stop the spread of COVID-19, to fight against the unexpected, unacceptable infodemic, and to ensure everyone's right to participate. Madam President, the current situation presents a serious challenge to the full realization of all rights and freedoms. In the Czech Republic, too, we had to rethink our possibilities. Let me echo the UN Secretary General once again. We are all in this together. To effectively combat the pandemic, we all need to be part of the response. Equal participation of everyone in the response is vital. This requires people to be informed, involved in decisions that affect them, and governments to be open, transparent, and responsive. In closing, we would like to pose a question to the distinguished representatives of the Special Procedures Coordination Committee. My question is as follows. How can the Human Rights Council be helpful in ensuring a meaningful follow-up to your recommendations? 
the Czech Republic is looking forward to building back better together with you. I thank you, Madam President. Thank you, Ambassador. And I now give the floor to Canada. Thank you very much, Madam President. I'd also like to thank uh, Ms. Maros Ramsastri and Mr. Pruras. As Australia has already delivered a statement on behalf of Canada, what I have actually is a question. Um, Given the challenges that COVID-19 has had on these special procedures mandate holders work, and, they, and as I um, explained, as how they have been coordinating, the question that I have is how have they adjusted their working methods in light of the constraints of the pandemic? Um, and how have they done so in terms of the requirements of the input that states have to provide in order for them to effectively discharge their mandates? The other question that I have is what specific challenges has the pandemic posed to your working methods? And are those working are, are there some of those working methods that you foresee can be useful in the future in the post-COVID environment? Thank you. Thank you very much. I now give the floor to Pakistan to be followed by Brazil, Uruguay, and Germany. Thank you, Madam President, for organizing today's informal online meeting. We thank the Coordination Committee for its detailed presentation. My delegation takes note of the work being done by the mandate holders in relation to the COVID-19. The pandemic presents a formidable challenge to the international community whose impact on basic human rights is still unfolding. Madam President, respect for human rights lie at the heart of Pakistan government's response strategy to the pandemic. A comprehensive relief package of 8 million US dollars has been rolled out for mitigating health and socioeconomic shocks of the disease. Out of this package, 900 million US dollars has been earmarked to deliver emergency cash to 12 million households, including minorities and transgender communities. Within two weeks, the government has dispersed cash to around 6 million families. Madam President, with regards to the COVID-19, my delegation would like to invite special attention of the mandate holders to the following points. Number one, as we fight the pandemic, we should not lose sight of supporting developing and least developed countries in their national efforts to safeguard and advance socioeconomic rights. It's more urgent than ever before that we don't leave anyone behind. There's also a need to ease burden of debt on these countries. In this regard, our prime minister has launched a global initiative on debt relief, which has been widely welcomed by the international community. My second point, it is unfortunate to observe that the hate pandemic has deeply infected some countries, including in the South Asia region. Global media, human rights organization, and international institutions have widely reported incidents of state-sponsored discrimination, stigmatization, negative profiling, and violence against individuals and groups based on their religion, color, ethnicity, and nationality. These incidents present a serious human rights challenge which needs immediate cure. My third and last point, the pandemic has further endangered lives and livelihoods of people living under foreign occupation. A similar distressing situation exists in occupied Jammu and Kashmir. Despite calls by the international community and several mandate holders, the occupation regime has yet to release critical prisoners and human rights defenders, including age individuals with existing health conditions, which remain incarcerated since last August. Full speed internet connectivity remains suspended. Unfortunately, the occupying power is enforcing illegal measures with brute force, which are aimed at altering the demographic structure of the distributed territory. Unfortunately, COVID-19 is providing an excuse to curb freedom of speech and assembly of the Kashmiri people, which is at variance with the guidance issued by the High Commissioner for human rights. Such grave human rights violations of the Kashmiri people should be outrightly denounced. I thank you, Madam President. Thank you very much. I now give the floor to Brazil, Ambassador. Thank you, Madam President. Thank you. Thanks also to Mrs. Hamasastri and to Mr. Puras. We really appreciate the opportunity to debate the many challenges posed by COVID-19. Our countries and societies are at the same time confronted with the difficult task of protecting lives and guaranteeing livelihoods for our population. This is by any means of measurement, the most challenging crisis of our of his, uh, re recent history. This is also a time for cooperation, not for competition. This is not a time for conf to confront, but to comfort. 
This is also a time for special rapporteurs to care for the victims of human rights violations and make sure that a human rights approach guide COVID-19 responses. Madam President, this is certainly not the time for mandate holders to try to use this pandemic and the tragedy of so many families as they lose their loved ones as an opportunity to advance their own agendas. I refer to a recent press release. We were appalled in Brazil to see that some mandate holders have criticized Brazil for economic measures adopted four years ago by our National Congress that have no role whatsoever in curtailing the government's capacity to increase public expenditure in order to protect the most vulnerable populations from the dire impacts of this pandemic. Philip Alston and Juan Pablo Borlavski issued a news release about Brazil two days ago that has no bearing with reality, much less with the facts. We provided timely facts, but they, they were ignored as usual. Every time some, and I stress some special rapporteurs because not, because not all of them do the same things, but every time some special rapporteurs do such a thing, that is based the press releases on groundless uh, allegations, they are not working for, to protect the victims of human rights violations, who should be the first and only objective of these press releases. Uh, you are, you special rapporteurs, are actually working against the system built to protect the victims, weakening its credibility and its legitimacy. Sadly, the system was not, nor the victims of human rights, were not a matter of concern for Mr. Olson and Mr. Bohulavsky in this press release. So um, I profit from this dialogue because I think we have to talk to each other and not through each other. We urge, Brazil urges all mandate holders to pay close attention to this crisis and adopt as many of you have already adopted a holistic approach to the work and on a short and long-term perspective. Madam President, Brazil has done a lot in the area of health, in the area of uh, social protection. With uh, We have a universal health system. We are treating everyone poor or rich, indigenous peoples, vulnerable populations, Everyone has had, migrants and, and refugees have had access to, uh, to treatment, to medicine, to all the resources with, uh, uh, without charge. We are also approving social protection measures, uh, measures to, to, um, to treat migrants, refugees, special attention to combat violence against women. We are doing a whole lot of things. And um, I have sent letters to the special reporters and to, to my colleagues here in Geneva and to heads of international organizations. I have, just to finish, I have uh, a question to the mandate holders. Uh, Brazil would like to ask mandate holders participating in this meeting their views on the importance of the equitable and timely access to affordable in quality medicine, vaccines and, and diagnostics and other medical products to the protection of the right to life and, and to health in the context of this pandemic. Thank you, Madam President. Thank you very much, Ambassador. I just wanted to say that we have now closed the list of speakers. I will give the floor now to Uruguay to be followed by Germany, Cuba and then Syria. Uruguay, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam President. To begin, let me thank you and the Coordination Committee of the Special Procedures for organizing this interesting exchange with states and other stakeholders. On behalf of Uruguay, we want to stress our full support to the work that is being done by the Special Procedures mandate holders in the context of the COVID-19 crisis. Indeed, we recognize the important work that the human rights system, including the Special Procedures, but also the treaty bodies and OHCHR, are doing in these exceptional circumstances, and it's our hope that we continue working together and strengthening our cooperation in order to find joint solutions to this pandemic, leaving no one behind. 
Since we are convinced of the importance of the technical guidance of the special procedures mandate holders, we want to underline how important it is to ensure that all the main documents and guidelines issued by them are available in due time in the official languages of the UN, including Spanish. In fact, its availability clearly affects the impact that their technical guidance can have on the ground. The United Nations systems plays a central role to coordinate the global response to the COVID-19 pandemic, as well as WHO, in leading the multilateral efforts to contain the spread of the virus. Uruguay is convinced that the HRC needs to respond timely to the current crisis in order to send a clear political message about the importance of adopting a human rights-based approach in the responses to the COVID-19, ensuring that all human rights, including those of the most vulnerable populations, are duly protected and fulfilled in each country national responses. Finally, we want to stress our appreciation for the important key messages shared today by the Coordination Committee in line with the advanced question presented by Uruguay. Thank you, Madam President. Thank you very much. And I now give the floor to Germany to be followed by Cuba uh, and then Syria and then, then the Maldives. Thank you, Madam President. Germany aligns itself with the EU statement. And I would like to thank you for the organizing of this informal meeting and the Special Procedure Coordinating Committee Ms. Anita Ramazastri and Daniel Spuras for their presence and valuable input. Germany is a dedicated support of the special procedures and welcomes their work done so far. Their guidance, as well as the guidance of the High Commissioner and uh, recently the Secretary General, are paramount in adopting a human rights based approach to COVID 19. And in this regard, we share the disappointment uh, that despite the unprecedented uh, global crisis which the Human Rights Council is facing, uh, it has so far been impossible to uh, stage a formal virtual meeting of the, of the Human Rights Council for purely technical reasons. That is regrettable and we hope that uh, it will change in the future. We believe that it is extremely important for the Human Rights Council to also find its voice on, human right, on the COVID-19 crisis in the uh, very near future. And Madam President, our Foreign Minister uh, Heiko Maas yesterday voiced that we share the view that any measures taken to counter the pandemic must be necessary and proportionate, pursue legitimate purposes, be limited in time, non discriminatory and respectful of international human rights law. Special procedures and treaty bodies have drawn particular attention to the situation of the most vulnerable in this pandemic, such as women and children, who are increasingly exposed to domestic violence, and we think we need to take decisive action to pose this trend. The efforts of the crisis can only be mitigated by enhanced international solidarity and global cooperation, and that is why Germany has responded to the appeal from the United Nations Secretary General and now is making 300 million euros available for the humanitarian aid during the corona crisis. That's about 10% of the uh, monies requested by the UN and the ICRC. And now my question to the special uh, uh, mandate holders, Mr. Zamazastri and Mr. Puras, recent restrictions have limited the space for civil society actors. How can and how should states ensure that the voice of civil society are heard during the pandemic? And I thank you very much. Thank you very much. And the floor now goes to Cuba. Thank you, Madam President. Our delegation appreciates the organization of this informal online meeting. We further thank the mandate holders for their presentations. Madam President, in the context of the current global crisis and the COVID-19 pandemic, it remains essential to enable an environment of solidarity and international cooperation. In that regard, however, the tightening of the economic, commercial, and financial blockade imposed by the United States government against Cuba constitutes the main obstacle to the development of our country, to the enjoyment of human rights by the Cuban people, and to the national efforts in facing the COVID-19 pandemic. In spite of that situation, allow me to inform you that at the request of 22 countries, Cuba has sent 24 specialized medical brigades to face COVID-19 made up of more than 2,000 health professionals, 60% of whom are women. These missions join 
more than 28,000 Cuban health professionals who were already serving cooperation missions in 61 countries. Madam President, I conclude with a question to the experts. What is your opinion on the continuation and tightening of unilateral coercive measures against developing countries and their impact on basic human rights in the context of COVID-19? I thank you, Madam President. Thank you very much. I will now pass the floor to the ambassador to Syria to be followed by Maldives, India, and then Bangladesh. Thank you, Madam President. Allow me at the outset to thank you for holding this informal meeting and to thank the speakers for the briefing on behalf of the special procedures mandate holders. I would like to focus my intervention on areas of concerns which were not duly reflected in the briefing. Over the past few weeks, UN and other international organizations have witnessed an extraordinary movement to forge coordinated collective response in the face of a global threat posed by COVID-19. UN Secretary General and High Commissioner for Human Rights called for solidarity and international cooperation in the face of this global pandemic which threatens all states and all peoples without discrimination. They both called for the immediate lifting of unilateral coercive measures, which impede the ability of targeted countries to effectively cope with COVID-19 crisis. Syria, along with a group of countries, addressed joint letters to UN Secretary General and uh, High Commissioner for Human Rights calling for the immediate lifting of unilateral coercive measures that cause widespread human suffering to nearly 2 billion people around the world and impede the ability of targeted countries to obtain medical equipment urgently needed to cope with the spread of the epidemic, to protect their citizens and to provide health care for the affected persons. Regrettably, those calls have not received an honest response from those who insist on holding these illegal measures, which are contrary to the spirit of solidarity and international cooperation as part of their foreign policy. We have taken note, Madam President, of the, state, of the statements recently issued by mandate holders. Syria underlines the statements issued by the Special Rapporteur on UCMs and the statements by the Special Rapporteur on the right to food which underlined the significant obstacles po posed by uh, continued uh, impo imposition of coercive measures on the ability of states to procure urgently needed medical supplies and to cope with accompanying economic and social impacts which are expected to stay longer with us, particularly in targeted countries and the ability to, their ability to provide their basic needs, including food. In light of the over, uh, overall comprehensive nature of violations associated with unilateral coercive measures, which in some cases amount to the comprehensive economic blockade, we expect mandate holders to pay due attention in the implementation of their mandates to the impact of unilateral coercive measures on the rights covered by their respective mandates, particularly in the context of the response to COVID-19. Finally, we would like to draw the attention of mandate holders, Madam President, to the situation of people under foreign occupation as part of vulnerable groups, particularly in the, under the current crisis. Thank you, Madam President. Thank you, Ambassador. And I pass the floor to the Ambassador of Maldives. Thank you, Madam President, for organizing this informal conversation today. I would also like to take this opportunity to thank the chair and member of the coordination committee of special procedures for presenting the work of mandate holders in relation to COVID-19. We also appreciate the understanding extended by the mandate holders to provide countries with a deferred deadline to respond to existing communications, as it is extremely taxing for countries like the Maldives that have limited capacity and with all of the government's attention at the moment focused on responding to the crisis at hand. Madam President, the global pandemic has created unprecedented challenges for all our countries. As emphasized by the general call by the special procedures mandate holders, 
everyone without exception has the right to life-saving interventions. And the Maldives firmly supports that it is important to effectively respond to this crisis without undermining human rights and democracy. Respect for human rights is vital, not only for the emergency response phase, but also for the post-crisis recovery phase. In this regard, the Maldives commends the initiatives taken by the special procedures in relation to COVID-19. We appreciate the guidance notes, reference tools, and recommendations by the mandate holders that covers a wide spectrum of human rights issues, and the Maldives takes heed of these important persistent reminders that are helpful in policy decisions to ensure the principles of non-discrimination, empowerment, participation, and accountability. Before I conclude, allow me to highlight one area of concern, and that is mental health and well-being. I would like to hear about the special specific, specific measures taken by the respective mandate holders to address the psychosocial impact of COVID-19 in societies and what are the recommendations made in this regard. I thank you. Thank you, Ambassador. I now pass the floor to India to be followed by Bangladesh, Israel, and then France. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, we thank you and the Bureau for organizing this informal conversation with the special procedures in relation to COVID-19 pandemic. We also thank the chair and the member of the coordination committee of the special procedures for their updates. The impact of the pandemic is still unfolding in a multi-dimensional manner, including on human rights and fundamental freedoms. We are all still assessing the full magnitude of its impact and consequences in future as well. In this context, tackling this threat requires all out efforts from every stakeholders. At the outset, we appreciate the guidelines issued by the special procedures from time to time on COVID-19 pandemic. We are of the view that the guidelines issued by the special reporter on the right to adequate housing are very relevant in this crisis. Alerts from SPs on many issues such as water and sanitation, rights of vulnerable and marginalized persons, public health discrimination are important reminders to all of us in tackling the pandemic. As we all are aware, the flow of information is very crucial in carrying out mandated activities by the special procedures. In the current situation, we would like to ask how the pandemic has affected the flow of credible information to the special procedures. Secondly, are media reports being considered by the special procedures as a source of information in the current difficult situation as exceptions? It is said that instead of joining the global and regional efforts in combating COVID-19, one country continues its disinformation campaign against India one can only advise this country to focus its efforts in tackling the pandemic domestically and particularly the sharp rise in number of cases only in the occupied territories and addressing the discrimination meted out to its minorities even in these hard times. Finally, we appreciate the constructive role of the special procedures in supplementing national efforts in every possible manner in accordance with the respective mandates. Thank you, Madam President. Thank you very much. And I pass the floor to Bangladesh. Thank you, Madam President. We would like to thank you and the Coordination Committee for this timely and important conversation. Bangladesh always values the importance of this special procedure mechanism. We strongly believe that with the right approach, this mechanism can be a very useful tool in protecting and promoting global human rights. The COVID-19 is having devastating impact on the societies across the globe, irrespective of their size, geographic location, and developmental status. The capacity of the governments to fight such a colossal pandemic has remained an issue, both in the developed and in the developing world. Still, governments in general, as, as well as the non-government partners, are undertaking tremendous efforts in, in this testing time. We believe Recognition and appreciations are due to all of them. To combat the spread of COVID-19, restrictive measures often have been the only option. As a result, regular affairs of the governments are greatly reduced 
in quantity and impaired in scope. Although some countries are planning to return to something close to normal business in phases, others are still undergoing a time of uncertainty and of impaired functionality for various reasons. So at these trying times, our expectation of the governments may need to be rationalized in terms of government's capacity to engage with the global mechanisms at a regular pace and extent. We trust all concerned are mindful of that. Madam President, the COVID-19 pandemic, one of the most pervasive phenomena in the history of mankind has direct or indirect bearing on all, on everyone in the world. Likewise, it has affected the enjoyment of all human rights, be it economic, social, cultural, or political rights. When looking at, the situa looking at this situation from a rights perspective, we cannot emphasize more that our approach must be very balanced without prioritizing one set over the other. We greatly appreciate the guidelines and recommendations made by the mandate holders in the context of the COVID-19 in their respective areas. These works indeed require much of their time and expertise and are often voluminous. So it would be desirable that relevant mandates have due coordination among those to themselves to avoid multiplicity, duplication of works, and more importantly, any possible conflict. Before I conclude, conclude, Madam President, I wish to thank you for recognizing many uplifting approaches taken in, uh, taken in member states in their response to the COVID-19. I thank you. Thank you very much. And I now pass the floor to Israel to be followed by France and then Switzerland and Ecuador. Thank you, Madam President. At the outset, Israel wishes to express its satisfaction that the current meeting can take place through technological means and express its appreciation for the opportunity given today to representatives of member states to exchange with special mandate holders, as well as the continuous effort to keep an open channel with states and other stakeholders. Currently, the activities of many international fora and human rights mechanisms have been disrupted by the measures required to combat the new coronavirus epidemic. Precisely at this moment, mandate holders should have a role in increasing cooperation on the ground and strengthen good practices and policies. In that regard, we wish to thank the special procedures for the guidelines that were published, giving important tools for states in dealing with the situation while maintaining their commitment to human rights. Despite the regrettable and relentless bias against Israel in the Human Rights Council, we are committed to engage with mandate holders as long as the issues are approached in a balanced manner manner and out of a genuine motivation to work with the country to improve the situation of human rights on the ground. Accordingly, we wish to refer to points raised in our previous statements that should be particularly emphasized today in the face of the corona crisis, but it is very aggravating to see certain, it is very aggravating to see certain special rapporteur using cynically the situation in one-sided and biased way against Israel that does not reflect at all the situation on the ground. Especially, we demand that mandate holders adhere to the need for constructive cooperation with states when considering their steps. In this regard, we wish to again emphasize that in order to allow constructive dialogue, much more attention should be given to the criteria for the issuing of public statements to make sure they don't only cater to the pressure of lobby groups. It is Israel's strong belief that not doing that leads to an unfortunate conclusion that the reality on the ground is not of real interest. As long as the situation continues, the credibility of mandate holders is diminishing. Further, we believe communications by group of rapporteurs dilutes the focus of the communications on particular questions and make them appear more like general observations. We have noticed with concern cases where certain rapporteurs were quick to add their names to communications on topics they had little or nothing to do with, raising doubts about their motivation and credibility. Israel believes that's the only way to contain the coronavirus pandemic is to join efforts with other international stakeholders far and near based on the expertise of scientists and the best practices and recommendations of international organizations. As opposed to what you've heard today from the Palestinian representative, there is a different reality on the ground. Since the beginning of the crisis, Israel acted in close cooperation with the PA to combat the coronavirus. Efforts which were mentioned and complemented by the Secretary General and the new and special coordinator for the Middle East peace process. In accordance to our statement, it was extremely unfortunate that the special procedures, and in particular the holder of the inherently biased mandate on the human rights in the Palestinian territories, decided to publish two press releases that had little or nothing to do with the facts, 
which proved once again that improving the reality on the ground, even in extreme times like this, is not of any interest to this mandate. We reiterate our seriousness and commitment to respecting, protecting, and promoting human rights, even in times of crisis, and specifically to engaging with the special procedures. However, we urge mandate holders to insist on the highest standard of professionalism and discernment when deciding to subscribe communications and press releases to avoid comprom compromising their credibility and serving politicized agendas that have very little to do with the cause for human rights. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And the next speaker is uh, Franz. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, friends warmly welcome to this very helpful and, and timely dialogue with the coordination committee and I want to express my appreciation for the, the, the excellent work and the excellent presentation by Mrs. Ramza Tati and Mr. Puros. And I want to reiterate uh, full support to the special, special procedures and I also want to thank them for very useful guidelines. We definitely think that the Human Rights Council and all human rights mechanisms have a key role to play and should continue to operate despite the pandemic. Upholding human rights is more important than ever before. It is a top priority for my government. The Human Rights Council should ensure that the measures implemented by states to address the COVID-19 outbreak are proportionate, time-limited, and don't violate human rights. Special procedures are key in making sure that human rights and fundamental freedoms are respected without discrimination of any kind, especially regarding human rights defenders, journalists, and women. Now my question to the distinguished representative of special procedures is access to sexual rights and reproductive health is key especially amid this crisis. Exceptional measures may facilitate access to safe abortions. Actually, such measures have been taken in my country. In your view, what could the special procedures do to highlight and help advance this issue? Well, thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. I now pass the floor to the ambassador of Switzerland to be followed by Ecuador. Afghanistan, South Africa, and then Armenia, and that will close the list of states. Ambassador, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam President. Switzerland welcomes this informal exchange and thanks Mrs. Wamsashti and Mr. Puras, the chair and member of the Coordination Committee of Special Procedures for their presentations today. During this unprecedented crisis, respect for all human rights is fundamental to the success of the public health response and for the recovery phase. Switzerland values the work undertaken by special procedures over the past weeks in highlighting specific challenges and in providing guidance in relation to the COVID-19 pandemic. We also appreciate that all these resources are compiled on the OHCHR website. We are struck by how existing inequalities and vulnerabilities have been exacerbated by the COVID-19 pandemic and by the measures taken to mitigate its spread and impact. This has highlighted how a precarious social economic situation, the absence of safety nets, as well as armed conflicts, can lead to a dramatic increase of poverty and people in need. Loosening the restrictive, restrictive measures and permitting economic activity to resume will help, but will not suffice to remedy the dire situation of millions of people worldwide. Issues such as homelessness, poverty, resilience, quality and accessibility of health services, working conditions, unemployment benefits will all have to be addressed through new lenses. As the pandemic and the ensuing economic crisis impact men and women differently, all efforts must be gender responsive. 
It is crucial to place the participation and the protection of women and girls at the center of the response, bearing in mind that women are the backbone of recovery in communities. The steps we take now will have long lasting implications in building a more equal and just world that is more resilient to future crises. Therefore, the goal of leaving no one behind is even more relevant today than it was in the past. At the same time, we have been experiencing positive short-term developments from reduced economic activities on the environment. Lower pollution, clearer skies, healthier vegetation. It may be the right time as we think of reopening certain economic activities to factor in environmental and climate change considerations, notably to move faster towards greener and sustainable energy resources. Switzerland supports the call by the Special Rapporteur on Human Rights and the Environment that COVID-19 should not be an excuse to roll back environmental protection and enforcement. This pandemic, like the other epidemics of Ebola, MERS, SARS and avian flu, illustrates the inextricable relationship between climate change and health security. It is widely recognized that the risk of zoonoses is increased due to increasing urbanization, to globalization and global warming. Madam President, we welcome the 10 principles outlined by the Special Rapporteur on the rights to freedom of peaceful assembly and of association. His press statement reaffirmed the importance of human rights, the rule of law, as well as of fundamental freedoms, such as the freedom of expression and peaceful assembly and association. We share the view that the protest and popular calls for reform that marked 2019 will likely continue and be further fueled by the economic downturn, uh, downturn caused by the crisis. We call upon states to facilitate such process by providing protesters to the extent possible with access to public space within sight and sound of their intended target audience and by protecting them without discrimination against any form of violence, threat or harassment. In this time when physical gatherings are restricted, it is even more important that freedom of peaceful assembly must also be respected online. It is essential to listen and aim to address the grievances being expressed rather than to repress the protests themselves with the risk of adding to rising social tension. To conclude, Madam, a question, how can member states best support special procedure during these times of crisis? Thank you very much. Thank you, Ambassador. And I now pass the floor to the Ambassador of Ecuador. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, please receive our appreciation for organizing this informal conversation with the special procedures mandate holders represented by two distinguished friends. Mrs. Anita Ramasastri, uh, with whom we have a very close relationship and cooperation concerning the group of experts on business and human rights and the working group on the legally binding instrument. And Dr. Dainius Puras, who held an official visit to Ecuador in September last year and had a constructive engagement with our authorities and other stakeholders. Madam President, Due to a technical difficulty, I was not able to speak in the last virtual conversation on April 9th. Therefore, I would like to take this opportunity to convey to all the distinguished ambassadors and representatives participating in this meeting the deep condolences and solidarity of the government and people of Ecuador with all those families who have lost their loved ones due to the, this pandemic, as well as a recognition to the different actions and initiatives undertaken by the states and other stakeholders to respond to this crisis and mitigate its impacts. As the United Nations General Assembly and the UN Secretary General have recognized, the COVID-19 pandemic has created a global public health, economic and social crisis with unprecedented and multidimensional uh, effects in our societies and economies um, for that, for the employment for the, and, and for the uh, enjoyment of human rights around the world. 
In that regard, we appreciate the active role of the special procedures in highlighting the human rights implications of the COVID-19 pandemic and offering recommendations in order to guide the states in ensuring that the, the responses to the crisis are in compliance with their human rights obligations. Until now, we have uh, identified more than 40 general press releases or statements from different special procedures mandate holders, which demonstrate their engagement in the response to the human rights challenges of the, this crisis. Nevertheless, uh, while reaffirming all, that all human rights are universal, in indivisible, interrelated, interdependent, and mutually reinforcing, we are also acknowledge that negative effects on the pandemic have, and most likely will continue to have, a greater impact in the poorest and most vulnerable people, with the risk of expanding already existing inequalities within and between countries and all sorts of uh, discrimination. In that sense, recognizing the urgent need for a stronger international cooperation, dialogue, unity, and solidarity to respond to this pandemic, we would like to know how these special procedures will contribute to foster a renewed multilateralism and is, that is able to support effectively those countries uh, whose population have been or will be most affected by this crisis in order to adopt and implement response and recovery measures that are in compliance with their human rights obligations. Finally, we would like to know how the coordination committee is in enhancing the coordination, effectiveness, dependence, and exchange of information and best practices between the special procedures mandate holders and with other human rights mechanisms in relation to the response to the COVID-19 pandemic. I thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ambassador. And I now give the floor to the Vice President and Ambassador of Afghanistan. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Madam President. And thanks to our colleagues from the Special uh, Procedures Coordinating Committee. Uh, Madam President, we all know that the COVID-19 is one of the very rare hyper events in, of the century the kind that plunges our interconnected world into uncertainty and disrupts normal uh, models of our conduct and how you, we human beings uh, socialize. Mastering a true sense of urgency, we have to mobilize all our national and international resources to face the challenge to our lively daily lives and to our uh, livelihoods. Madam President, I would like to emphasize on the uh, uh, countries that, which are already in fragile uh, situation or facing situation of, of conflict uh, and terrorism, uh, that they are in the greater need of international uh, solidarity uh, to mitigate the grave uh, consequences, health and social and economic uh, consequences or challenges of uh, emanating from the COVID-19. Uh, in, uh, in, in, in this line, provision uh, and equitable access uh, to health products and also uninterrupted cross-border movement of uh, these items and also other necessary items, including food item, is uh, very important and necessary. And as the countries at the national level are adjusting and reorienting their uh, policies, and hence we emphasize on our development partners and international organization, also uh, to swiftly adjust their priorities and also to improve and increase their coordination with the state governments at, at the field level. Uh, Madam President, finally, as uh, it was alluded by uh, most of the other uh, speakers, that the, uh, this COVID-19 crisis already doubles and triples the existing uh, vulnerabilities. The whole uh, human rights uh, uh, machinery and mechanism, including the uh, special procedures, are needed uh, to become more active uh, by uh, continuously reminding, urging, and informing uh, the member states of the importance of promotion and protection of all spectrums of human rights during this crisis. And I thank you very much. Thank you, Ambassador. And I pass the floor to the Ambassador of South Africa. You have the floor, Mandy. Thank you, Madam President. And good afternoon, Excellencies and uh, colleagues. Let me begin by thanking you, 
and uh, the chair of the committee of the uh, coordinating committee of the special procedures and uh, for giving us time to be able to interact act with them. I'd like to begin by reiterating South Africa's commitment to the system of special procedures and uh, support for the work that um, they, 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 they do <clears throat> and um, the advice that we get from them to guide us in what is an unprecedented uh, situation. I could not agree with you more, Madam Chair, in what you said in your opening statement. COVID is in essence a challenge, a human rights challenge. How my country has looked at it is that as an individual, there are no rights that are outside me that will come into me and give me my humanity. So how it responds to the, the, the pandemic, it, it is responding to key challenges to human rights. The right to shelter, the right to uh, uh, food, uh, the right to all uh, uh, kinds of things. So how we frame the language in terms of our understanding of COVID is that it's not apart from human rights. It is human rights. It affects all human uh, rights. So how do we rise together, drawing on the resources that we, uh, we have? And we're having these conversations in, in, a, in, in a time of uncertainty. A lot is unknown. And we don't know where we're going to end up. We didn't have prior warning of this massive nature of the, of the, of the pandemic. So all the more important that we move together, but uh, uh, hear each other and uh, um, seek to understand and to empower um, uh, each other as, as it were. So I hope that we will leave open the possibility that such, is the development of the pandemic that there may be things that we do not know, that no definitive statements can be made now, useful as the statements that are being made are. In relation to Agenda 2030, we're at ground zero. It would be interesting to hear how sectorally the special procedures would propose we begin. It cannot be business as usual. And in relation to many agreements that we have, we're basically at ground zero. And the, and, and the situation of developing countries is really dire because the progress that we made, we made on gender empowerment has literally been wiped out in a context where we have no resources. So the Secretary General says we have to reimagine ourselves and in trying to imagine what kind of world we're going to wake up uh, to that is, that is underpinned by the rule of law. I, I, I would like a comment on their special procedures, particularly in relation to the power balance and how they see their role, which necessarily has to go beyond what they are doing now with affirming certain things, such as the global uh, public goods that are necessary for dealing with the pandemic, but also for recovery for developing uh, countries, access to vaccines, access to uh, ventilators and things of a, uh, uh, at that nature. I hope for the Human Rights Council that we learn the lesson that these discussions that we have that are neither here nor there, or the validity of on the one side of civil and political rights as against socioeconomic rights, the time for that has to end. And that we treat human rights as indivisibly as they are and interdependent as they are. And here we need also the special procedures to guide us to find each other in terms of what they anticipate will be on the ground and what will be required, for example, with regards to uh, social protection. None of us are perfect in this uh, and none of us can afford to look, at, look down at the others. We're all trying to do the best we can. My continent is struggling to do the best uh, it can. We hope also the special procedures will draw on good practice uh, from the, 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 the continent. How are the special procedures going to then refocus us to this new world that is coming that will necessarily have to hinge on focus on socioeconomic uh, 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 um, rights? Also, it's important that 
the special procedure offend the multilateral institutions that are under siege, such as the World Health Organization? Is there a possibility of their commentary speaking to the dangers of eroding the credibility of an institution just when we need it? I thank you. Thank you, Ambassador. And I will now give the floor to Armenia as the last speaker from the representative of states. After that, we'll start with NGOs and the last will be Amnesty International. I thank you, President. Armenia, can you hear me? Armenia appreciates convening the second virtual informal HRC meeting on COVID-19 and the presentations by Anita Ramazasti and Daniel Spuros on the work of the special procedures. This is a clear indication that the UN human rights machinery continues to be vigilant to the challenges posed by this extraordinary situation. In particular, we would like to emphasize the importance of the guidance and recommendations that are continually disseminated by the special procedures mandate holders, helping the states in the current unprecedented situation to address the issues they confront. Armenia touches great importance to the protection of the rights of everyone without distinction, leaving no one behind including the most vulnerable groups, such as women, children, people of senior age, refugees, and people residing in conflict areas. In this regard, we value concentration of joint efforts, avoiding scapegoating, stigmatization, and discrimination, both in public discourse and actions taken by authorities. Armenia supported the call of the Secretary General for observing global ceasefire, during this time of pandemic, we believe that conflict situations should get larger attention from the international community, exactly from the human rights perspective. We need to consider the global nature of the challenge we all confront without any distinction on the basis of the political, jurisdictional, or international status of a country or territory, and with a view of the preciousness of every human life. In conclusion, we would like to pose the following questions to our distinguished panelists. First, how best to ensure the protection from the domestic violence in the time of containment and isolation, as there are alarming reports on increasing figures of on this egregious score, scourge. Second, given the misuse by some governance of the restrictive measures for enhancing trend crackdown on the dissidents, do the special procedure mandate holders consider elaborating measures on mitigating the impact of such situations in future similar scenarios? I thank you, Madam President. Thank you very much. And as I said, we'll start now with a list of speakers from NGOs. I'm very sorry we'll not be able to accommodate everybody because as you see, we have already spent quite some time. I'll give you very briefly the list of NGOs which are going to get the floor later on. Amnesty International Now, followed by Child Rights Connect, Human Rights Watch, Fian, and finally, uh, Conselio Indigenista Mission. Uh, I'm sorry for mispronouncing this. Amnesty International, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam President. Amnesty International delivers this statement on behalf of 11 NGOs. We thank the Coordination Committee for the update on the work undertaken by the special procedures to highlight the human rights impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic. As states undertake extraordinary measures to curb the spread of COVID-19, we recognize the good faith efforts of many states to effectively protect the right to life, the right to health and other human rights, including the principle of non-discrimination. We also recognize that in other contexts, states have used emergency powers to enact repressive measures that do not comply with the principles of legality, proportionality and necessity, and that may have the effect or intention of suppressing criticism and minimizing dissent. In this regard, we take heart at the special procedure statement that the COVID-19 crisis cannot be solved with public health and emergency measures only. All other human rights must be addressed too. We also welcome the various tools that have been developed by the mandate holders, such as the COVID-19 Freedom Tracker, the dispatches, video messages and guidelines, in addition to the vast number of press releases. Making these tools readily accessible to all stakeholders is critical, 
as he's considering ways to receive feedback and share learnings about their application. We encourage the special procedures to continue to deepen their analysis of state responses, including through reports to the Human Rights Council and the General Assembly, and to offer guidance to states on how to respond to the crisis in a human rights compliant manner. Last but not least, we urge member states to, to cooperate fully with the special procedures. While country visits are suspended for the time being, this should not be used as an excuse not to cooperate. We call on states to respond in a timely manner to communications from the special procedures and to seek technical and expert advice from relevant mandate holders in relation to draft legislation to ensure that these are in line with states' obligations to respect, protect and fulfill all human rights. Thank you. Thank you very much. And the next speaker is Child Rights Connect. Thank you, Madam President. This is a joint statement. We thank Madam Ramasastri and Mr. Puras for today's discussion. We welcome the work of a special procedures in repeatedly looking at the impact of COVID-19 on children's rights, in particular at the need for the states to boost child protection measures. It is indeed important to acknowledge that the current pandemic and the state's responses are having a particularly severe impact on the full range of children's rights, to a different extent depending on the context. Although states are addressing the most urgent aspects relating to the public health crisis, states should not, not lose sight that all rights are equally important under the Convention on the Rights of the Child, and all should be equally implemented. In this regard, and in order to mitigate immediate and long-term measures and impacts on children, states should undertake a comprehensive child rights-based impact assessment to identify the specific steps needed. At the same time, children have not remained passive in the face of this situation and are organizing themselves in many ways, mainly through digital means, to support each other, exchange information and provide solutions. States should continue to ensure spaces for safe, inclusive, and meaningful participation and disseminate child-friendly and accessible information. These actions are examples to be monitored and taken into account by special procedures when it comes to providing guidance to states, especially on freedom of association, assembly, and expression. Special procedures can also continue to play a critical role in providing guidance to states regarding children in the most vulnerable situations, such as girls, children in the street situations, and children without or at risk uh, of losing their parental control, their parental care. Children and their views have been almost invisible since the outbreak. Now, more than ever, special procedures can play a role in amplifying children's voices and ensuring that their opinions are heard and taken into account. Thus, we urge you to strengthen child rights monitoring and exploring new ways of reaching out to children through digital means. We hope that this meeting will be the first of a series of opportunities to exchange with the special procedures. And we would like to suggest that for future meetings, uh, we look into the specific effects of this pandemic on specific groups. We take this opportunity as well to invite all of you to a virtual meeting that we are organizing with the support of the European Union, Germany, Slovenia, and Uruguay to have an initial discussion and share good practices, practices on adopting a child rights-based approach to COVID-19. This will take place on Tuesday, May 5th, uh, from 12.30 to 2. We thank you for this opportunity and we look forward to hearing your views on this. Thank you very much. And the next speaker is Human Rights Watch. Thank you, Madam President. We welcome the extensive reporting on the human rights impact of the COVID-19 pandemic carried out by UN Special Procedures who have been at the forefront of addressing a broad range of human rights concerns. We particularly welcome the much needed attention to economic, social, and cultural rights, including access to health, adequate housing, food, education, work, water, and sanitation, in a context where these have often been treated by some states as of lesser importance. Taken together with violations of freedom of expression, association, access to information, privacy, and from arbitrary detention, it is hard to imagine a more striking example of the interconnectedness and indivisibility of rights. We have also appreciated the special procedures attention to principles of non-discrimination and the needs of the most vulnerable, including older persons, those living in poverty and the homeless, ethnic and religious minorities, women, people with disabilities, LGBT people, migrants, refugees, and children. We have been pleased to see many governments adopt recommendations by special procedures and model good practices. A number of countries, for example, have guaranteed that water will not be cut off or have deferred utility payments. In a number of jurisdictions, including Afghanistan, Sudan, Pakistan, and Poland, the authorities have released significant numbers of detainees in order to reduce prison overcrowding. 
However, in many countries, prison overcrowding has not been addressed, leaving countless inmates, including political prisoners and prison staff at greater risk. France has offered free accommodation to many victims of domestic violence, while in Italy, local authorities were authorized to repurpose otherwise unused hotels to accommodate people fleeing from violence in the home. We do share the concerns about the misuse of emergency powers and appreciate the guidance on the importance of ensuring that these are strictly lawful, necessary, and proportionate. A striking example of overreach are the sweeping powers adopted by Hungary, which as the SOGI independent expert noted just this week, appears poised to misuse these powers to deny transgender people legal recognition for reasons unrelated to the pandemic. The sheer volume of state policies and practices affecting human rights highlights the importance of establishing a systematic process for assessing state responses, both good practices and areas of concern, and we support the calls for more, more formal council engagement. We welcome the report just released by the Special Rapporteur on Freedom of Expression, which highlights the importance of freedom of expression and access to information in the context of the pandemic and the perils of censorship. The international community should not shy away from asking the tough questions about what more could have been done to prevent the spread of the virus and whether state censorship, including intimidating doctors who sought to sound the alarm, suppressing information and downplaying the extent of the threat may have contributed to the global crisis that all nations are facing today. Understanding the lessons learned is key to prevention and better predicting the right to health in future. We have sometimes seen, seen attacks on the system of special procedures or attempts to impose state oversight of their activities. The crucial role special procedures have played in responding to this crisis highlights the importance of resisting any attempt to interfere with their independence. Madam President, it is clear that we are living through a health and human rights crisis whose effects will be felt for years to come. We look forward to working with states and all stakeholders to support the vital work of the special procedures. Thank you. Thank you very much. And the next speaker is Fian. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Madam President. Uh, Afian, we've been monitoring the situation thanks to information that we received from our national sections, as well as our members of the Global Network on the Right to Food and Nutrition. Uh, we published uh, a first monitoring report and we intend to publish monthly updates on the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on the right to food and nutrition. Uh, this current health crisis is also leading to a food crisis. And we believe at this time that it's important to emphasize that some of the structural causes of hunger and malnutrition that have been denounced for many years are also the underlying causes of the COVID-19 pandemic itself, as well as aggravating its consequences. For instance, we know, according to United Nations Environment Program and uh, some scientists, that land grabbing, eco-destruction and destruction of biodiversity means that we are more prone to diseases which originate in animals. We've also seen the vulnerability of our food system with food shortages in some regions and countries uh, due to our reliance on global food chains. Ultra-processed foods, which cause obesity and diabetes, are an important risk factor uh, of COVID-19. The exposure to pesticides that also lead to respiratory diseases and also diminish our uh, immune systems are also important risk factors uh, of COVID-19. With regard to the vulnerable groups uh, mentioned by the special operators and also some delegations, we want to point out to the particular vulnerable situation of peasants and other people working in rural areas who produce 80% uh, of our food, according to FAO, and who have been left out from some of the government measures uh, in response to COVID-19. We've observed, for instance, the closure of peasant markets whilst uh, supermarkets uh, have been able to remain open. We also see a lack of healthcare infrastructures in rural areas. What comments could mandate holders make with regards to peasants and other people living in rural areas and ensure that states mainstream measures for this vulnerable group in their policy responses to COVID-19? Uh, especially considering that in 2018, UN adopted a declaration on the rights of peasants and other people working in rural areas. Can this crisis represent an opportunity to begin implementing the rights enshrined in this declaration? Uh, finally, Madam President, we welcome uh, the opportunity to participate in such virtual meetings. Um, some delegations have also emphasized the importance of civil society in these times and ensuring participation of all. Uh, in this sense, uh, we are concerned about the normalization of such virtual practices, which in some cases do discriminate the participation of certain categories of population. Not all have access to internet. 
there are also issues regarding the timetable of such meetings, which can also make it difficult for people from certain regions to participate. We hope that these considerations, although it's difficult to accommodate everyone, uh, will be taken into account. Uh, thank you very much once again. Thank you. And I now give the floor to the Consiglio Indigenista. President. Simi thanks the Madam High Commission on, and a wide range of special procedure mandates that have taken immediate action in view of COVID-19. We are also thankful for the specific provision of indigenous peoples and in the COVID-19 guidance by emphasizing the need to take into account their specific concepts of health to control the entry of persons in their territories and in particular non-contacted groups by the implementation of cordons to avoid any foreign contact. Other recommendations, such as in the case of forced evictions, have reinforced the specific indigenous provisions. We invite the rapporteur on the indigenous peoples to further discuss the immediate and long-term effects of these pandemics on indigenous populations. Regretfully, in Brazil, the federal government is not only disregarding the positive obligations of special care towards indigenous peoples, but also interfering with indigenous peoples' freedom during the pandemic. In both cases, the disastrous effects of these people on these peoples is incalculable. There is a lack of practical contingency plan to prevent as much as possible contagions of indigenous communities. The newly appointed Minister of Justice of Pentecostal Faith may favor the government's and allies' desire to convert non-contacted -con communities. The new health minister prones at privatizing indigenous health services, risking their affordability. The new FUNAI Ordinance 9-2020, adopted during the pandemic, favors the tightening of private owners on indigenous lands, even if the demarcation procedures is at an advanced stage in violation of Brazil's constitution and international law. We firmly support the joint statement made by several special procedures reporting on the responsible economic and social policies, policies that put millions of lives at risk, reflecting the reality on the ground in view of the drastic austerity measures that freeze social expenditure for 20 years. Fortunately, Indigenous peoples are organizing themselves in Brazil, taking self-protective measures and sharing relevant health information. This year's edition of the Acampamento Terra Livre, the largest indigenous event in Brazil, takes place through social media, thanks to the leadership, solidarity, and the strength of the indigenous leaders, movements, and partners. I thank you. Thank you very much. So we had more than two hours concentrated questions and comments uh, for our two members of the coordinating committee. Uh, I'm now handing over to you. There will be a lot to answer all of this. And we start with Dr. Puras. You have the floor. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, first of all, I want to thank uh, the uh, all distinguished delegates and NGOs, these questions demonstrate uh, good signs of our mutual understanding and uh, uh, high level of agreement on, on critical issues, so which may indicate good prognosis for uh, response to pandemic and uh, moving to recovery and then effective recovery. I would like to mainly focus on health-related uh, questions, so I cannot avoid <laughs> that I am a special rapporteur on right to health, and I'm proud of it, of this, but again, I am here today as a member of coordination committee. But uh, right to health is now in the center, but right to health, as we indicated today, with examples from many mandate holders, can be exercised if all other human rights are activated and uh, um, pro protected and promoted. And the, we provided many examples. 
Uh, what uh, lessons could we learn from this uh, pandemic uh, still to be explored? And I'm working on this and uh, uh, my successor for sure will, will work on this. We have already good lessons from other public health crises. Of course, they all are different, but principles are the same. And actually, Right to Health mandate um, was established as a consequence of understanding that uh, to address effectively AIDS epidemic, the best way is human rights-based approach. Uh, and then uh, good things started. And now, as you know, we are moving to elimination of, of, of AIDS because human rights of people in vulnerable situations were taken seriously. And um, I think we have uh, some many similar issues uh, now. Um, also, the crisis revealed the um, weakness of some healthcare systems, even in advanced countries. So we, we have to still to, to learn lessons and to reconsider what we recommend to developing countries, do we recommend to replicate um, planning, funding, and uh, management of healthcare systems as it happens in advanced countries? Or maybe some things should be done differently, but not the, the principles. Principles, right to health, uh, analytical framework, which was developed by my predecessors, Paul Hunt and Anand Grover, uh, is very well budgeted to uh, address this pandemic. And I looked through all the reports of my mandate since 2002. Uh, and many reports are very important for, for, for this crisis. I mean, re uh, recommendations. Uh, one interesting thing which was also raised by Maldives is about uh, what about psychosocial issues and mental health. Uh, yes, experts think that it will come at, at maybe next stage. Now people are mobilizing, but uh, probably when economic and social consequences of crisis will be more visible, uh, mental health there can be more uh, serious burden of different mental health conditions. And we should uh, rethink some um, principles of how global community has been addressing this issue re during recent decades. And I am proud that Human Rights Council was very progressive in this regard. And I want to remind us that in 2016 and 2017, Human Rights Council adopted two powerful resolutions on uh, mental health and human rights. And uh, we should recommend to everyone these resolutions because these resolutions very openly tell that countries should move away from uh, institutionalization, over medicalization. And now we can see that these uh, settings of institutional care are not adequate, if not to say more, because they may become you know, uh, centers of contagion. And so that we now there are no visitors, which means that these people are closed there even more than ever before without any oversight of human rights and so on. So high time to move uh, in a responsive way to, uh, to the institutionalization and to develop community mental health services globally. Of course, we cannot just open institutions and then tell people go, go to the street, we have to to have decent conditions uh, uh, for these people in the community. But in general, uh, the, the, the crisis revealed sobering effect that there are too many people uh, in institutions, not only because of mental health issues, but uh, uh, and now those who are detained arbitrarily and now this process of releasing the people from institution started, which is uh, which is a good sign. Um, so um, there are also many good, uh, many good uh, practices. Uh, I am sure that Anita will, will tell more, but our special rapporteur on right to housing, which we 
it from Leilani often today, and uh, this is the uh, last day of rapporteurship for, for many of our colleagues, and we thank them uh, very much. Uh, she just uh, yesterday um, uh, had an op-ed and praised countries just to tell that we are we are commending and praising countries often, not only criticizing for good practices in, in uh, adequate uh, in the field of adequate housing. She praised Kenya, Ethiopia, and Spain, and Canada, and Germany, and UK, and US. And so many more good practices evolving during this crisis, which shows a good, uh, good opportunity for better work together, solidarity, and mutual understanding. I know that we have not have much time and I want to leave more time to Anita. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And I pass over the floor immediately to you, Mrs. Hamasastri. Thank you very much, Madam President. And thank you to your excellencies, to civil society representatives for sharing your views with us today. We will take all of your messages back, your questions, your thoughts, your concerns, because this will help us do our work better. Um, I want to first begin by addressing um, some of your general questions about how special procedures and mandate holders are operating during this very unusual time. Just to give you a sense that, of course, we don't want there to be any protection gaps during this time, and we are working our best to ensure that is the case. But of course, our methods of work have been curtailed, as you you can uh, you have mentioned. The, one of them is, of course, that we are not going on any country visits at the moment. Um, and so with that, of course, we are not able to meet with stakeholders and travel to experience and meet with rights holders on the ground. That being said, we as a group are working as much as we can with communications and other tools and using technology both to meet and consult and confer uh, with one another, but also to do our work and to speak to affected people and communities. And many different rapporteurs are using technology to do that. And I thank as well the High Commissioner's Office that is also trying to offer platforms to those mandate holders that may lack the technology themselves. So we are using this opportunity to convene, to consult in a remote way. Uh, there were questions about how we're dealing with communications again, as one knows with the communications process, we will always do our best to verify the information that, it, that we receive, which often does come both pre-COVID and now from a distance. So in terms of communications procedures, we are still going ahead, still trying our best to verify. So I wouldn't say that it's different. Our main difference is that we are now operating remotely. What that will mean moving forward though, are some opportunities and some other things that we hope will change as, as we do emerge from this crisis. The first is that we, we are working collectively together. The document that you see before you today is a real collective expression of a desire to work together and share collective messages and experiences. We will continue to convene as a group and we'll think about what other tools, messages, and guidance we can create for uh, the Human Rights Council and for states and stakeholders that may be useful. So we welcome your suggestions, but please know that after this dialogue, that is the next phase. Our web page will be a constant updating and archive of all of our recommendations and tools for you, but we are thinking about additional messages and documents and, and tools for you. But in terms of the future, while we are working as best as we can remotely, I would like to say that we do consider that exceptional. I think that for everyone, we hope in the future that we are able to engage with you in person rather than virtually, and again, go back to our, our methods of work that allows us that personal interaction with rights holders. It is through that personal dialogue and being on the ground that we are able to protect human rights more robustly. But in the, we, you have our commitment that we will continue to operate under these exceptional circumstances while we can. With that, there were some specific questions. I'll try to address them as best as I can. Please understand that I am representing the views of my colleagues, so I hope I accurately reflect their work but we really ask you to go to the document that we have shared with you today, but, but we actually encourage you to go directly to those mandate holders for bilateral conversations around a lot of the issues relating to gender, relating to sexual and reproductive health, freedom of expression. So many issues were raised today of housing, of issues of development. Speak to these individual mandate holders because they really have some insightful recommendations for you and also want to know about your good practices. 
On the issue of reprisals, we have not yet seen reprisals against mandate holders at the moment. I will say that the outgoing special rapporteur on human rights defenders, uh, while not issuing a specific public statement, has noted that the shift in need for both private and public security forces to deal with issues of quarantines and other matters has led to we see a rise in threats to the lives and security of human rights defenders. So while we are seeing the movement of security personnel away from uh, protecting defenders and others, what we're seeing then is an increase in, in, in violence. And so that this is just an issue for states to consider, which is how do we fill that gap? Uh, other issues that were asked about were issues relating to sanctions and unilateral you know, coercive measures. I should just note that in, that special procedures has re have recognized the emergency situation facing various countries in fighting the pandemic, including reported challenges in accessing medical supplies due to sanctions. And in a recent press release, a number of experts echoed the High Commissioner Bachelet's call for the easing of sanctions to enable medical systems to fight COVID-19 and limit global contagion. Again, certain mandates have spoken on these issues and I would refer you to those statements in terms of, of looking at the issue more precisely. Uh, in terms of other questions about uh, freedom of association, again, I think I thank the states who re uh, have referenced of the special rapporteur on freedom of association and assembly and his 10 key principles, an attempt to create tools for states in balancing public health restrictions with these fundamental freedoms. And so I think again, an example of a tool. In terms of issues of sexual and reproductive health, the working group uh, um, on discrimination against women has called out this particular vacuum and, and, and issue and has called for states to, to, to really focus on continuity of service in terms of healthcare and universal healthcare in this area. Are there specific good practices there? I think that would be the next step for the, for the group. But again, I would commit, uh, recommend that you look at their statement on that very specific issue. With respect to debt, the independent expert on foreign debt has actually issued in one of his statements, a statement saying that this would be a time where states might be able to claim necessity with respect to payment of uh, sovereign debt obligations. Uh, but linked that issue of, 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 of not repaying or moratorium on debt directly to issues of using those funds for economic and social rights and protections. So while claiming relief, states should also honor their own obligations and use the funds that they aren't repaying uh, for protection of, of their individual citizens. Similarly, my working group has focused on issues of what home states can do when their businesses are engaging overseas and are receiving foreign assistance to ensure protections for workers at the, in supply chains and people who are operating in other jurisdictions. Again, thinking about the well being across the ecosystem. I think there have been some questions about development, about debt, about how we're going to all share this burden. I would just say that those are issues that mandates are beginning to think about as we think about middle, middle and long term solutions. That we don't have those answers now, but we are thinking about the questions of prevention and thinking about human rights um, and this common challenge as we move forward to look at what will happen next in, in terms of sustainable development, the SDGs, and our own work uh, as a global system. I'm sure I haven't answered all of the questions that you have asked. I hope that you have, will take away our key messages and our key tools about non-discrimination, about not using emergency measures in a way that violate human rights and are disproportionate to the need for which they are, are, are created. Uh, issues really strongly, we encourage you to look at issues of inequality in this current situation, that all of our messages and our tools are about asking states to take thoughtful human rights-based approaches to their policy choices. We've pointed out what has happened when that hasn't occurred, and we are hoping that as we move forward together, these principles and these, these lenses will help states with a human rights approach, as Danius mentioned, uh, to, to this, because ultimately it will lead to protection of the right to life and right to health. I'll stop there and I'll say again, thank you to all of you for this opportunity. Uh, we hope that this is not the last opportunity we have for dialogue, especially during this time. And Madam President, I want to thank you and the Bureau for extending this invitation to us and that we hope you found it fruitful as well. Thank you very much indeed uh, for having uh, kept with us so long, like a fully fledged session of the council really, and a very rich and interesting discussion.
I would like to thank, first of all, Mrs. Ramasastri uh, for having coordinated uh, all this and Dr. Puras. I would also like to thank all the members of the coordinating committee and um, via them, the whole uh, entity of special rapporteurs. I would in particular like to thank those uh, who are leaving tomorrow and who, as we know, have worked really until the very end of their mandate uh, to assist the council, to help the council. I would like to thank you all for the very valuable input you have made, which delegations now have an opportunity to go through. And we are, we are very happy to hear that this will be updated. And I can only say on behalf of the council, the more you coordinate, the, the easier you make the work for us. So thank you very much for that. And as somebody mentioned, altogether you are the crown jewels of this council. I would also like to thank all the participants. We have had over 200 in people who, who were included on the UN platform and no doubt there were people who followed via, via outside. I think this was an interesting discussion which showed to all of us that this is a crisis which affects us all in many ways. And it really is an opportunity for the entire international community to act as one. It is a health crisis as well as a human rights crisis. Uh, and I think the debate has shown very well that human rights are not a luxury that we can think about afterwards once the crisis is over. It's really part and parcel of the solutions and responses we have to find. The principles we're talking about are not new, but we are talking about an entirely new and unprecedented context. We have seen over the last few weeks that a majority of governments worldwide have taken special measures to address this crisis, and all of them had to make some kind of trade-off between the right to life and to health and certain personal freedoms. And it's very important to stress, and many of you have said that these measures need to be necessary, proportionate, and non-discriminatory. This debate was not only about taking a look at the problems we have, but it was all also meant to be as a look ahead. What, what is there in store for us to do? What do we have to do? And in that context, I'd like to recall what the Secretary General said, not only that we are in this together, all of us, but also, that uh, we must not discriminate between people. And in the same way, we must not pick and choose between human rights. They are all important. It was a pleasure to have this discussion with you, even if it was only virtually. Uh, it, I really uh, enjoyed seeing you again. I hope in the not too distant future, we'll be able to have normal meetings again. But in the meantime, this was a precious occasion to meet, to exchange, and thank you very much for that, all of you, and have a nice day, and all the best uh, to, in particular, to our two special rapporteurs, and Paul. thank you very much again for all the work you have invested into. Goodbye.